Thank you. We are back with Queen Anne's County Board of Education work session on Wednesday, July 22nd. On our agenda, we have presentations, uh, the Queen Anne's County Public Schools District Recovery Plan to reopening update. Mr. Pluski. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Paluski. Well, this afternoon or this evening, we have uh, a team of um, experts, uh, leaders from Queen Anne's County Public Schools, administrators and central office who are going to uh, share with us updates uh, on our recommendation for the reopening of schools in September. Uh, lots of to do and lots of conversation right now with regard to which school districts are, are recommending uh, fully virtual and which are not. And we do know that there are several districts that have already made the announcement that they are going to open fully virtual. We had a recommendation to open fully virtual for secondary students. We did recognize uh, parent um, comments. So thank you to all of the parents who um, shared comments respectfully on the, on the district website with regard to whether or not we should open virtually or open face to face. So we have considered all of those um, comments and Mr. Pelosi a little bit later is gonna share a general synopsis of what those comments entailed with regard to each section of our reopening plan. Um, so right now, the purpose, you can go ahead, uh, Ms. Belusky, the purpose of this presentation this evening is to go ahead and to communicate and provide the updates for, uh, for the most part, it's team one and Tiger team two, with um, which are, we'll talk about the safeguards that we will put in place and we'll talk about some schedules that we'll have for elementary, middle and high school. So we'll make sure that we provide those updates and you already know how our plan is structured. We have not changed that. It mirrors our continuity of learning plan with three phases for planning and organizing, implementing and supporting, and of course, evaluating and making adjustments. Just a reminder about our milestones. We started with our Tiger teams back in May, May 29th. Uh, we, got, we had several checkpoints along the way throughout the month of June. And then July 1st, we made recommendations to the Board of Education with regard to how we, sh we thought we might open school. June, July 1st through the 24th, which we've got a couple more days before the 24th arrives, but we have garnered all of the input that we have gotten thus far from parents. We made sure that we had um, an opportunity for public input and we did receive that. And then of course, today we're gonna make a recommendation to the board just to um, be clear, the recommendations that you will hear today are from Tiger Teams 1 and Tiger Teams 2. 3, 4, uh, 5, and 6 remain the same. There are no changes. We, um, we're, we're, we're still making the same recommendations that we made for those. These are the Teams 1 and Teams 2. We, they really worked on the schedules and they worked on the safeguards that are necessary to be in school or virtual and the difference if it's virtual they'll talk a bit about the difference between what happened this past spring and what we anticipate should we open virtually this fall um, and there is quite a bit of difference there and of course you do know that on august the 14th each district is uh, required to have their reopening plan uh, posted on the website and we'll also submit it to MSDE at that point. Clean, so couldn't submit it earlier. Oh, we, we certainly can. Sorry. That's just the deadline. So, you know, we are, we are in complete control of that. So we'll be making recommendations tonight. Um, and then of course, Mr. Paluski is going to talk about some of the responses at this point from community feedback. Mr. Paluski. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. For the record, my name is Greg Paluski, Deputy Superintendent. And uh, I'd like to share with you since July the 1st, um, some of the feedback or themes rather that we've received uh, once we initially put out our plan on July the 1st. So what you can see, which, which I think is, is outstanding, that we received over 530 or 534 responses. Uh, I'm not gonna go down through, but you can see kind of a breakdown of when general comments and then in each section of the plan. Uh, there would be no surprise that in section two, which is continuity of teaching and learning, where we saw the most responses. And, and you will see um, really that has to do with 
you know, either opening in a virtual environment or opening some kind of hybrid model where there was lots of feedback uh, in that area. So with that kind of overall summary, uh, I'll just go over the themes. And then the themes emerged because there were multiple individuals that may have talked about or provided comments. So I just want to make sure that I highlight those themes as it relates to each area. Uh, there was a lot of feedback around additional custodians, uh, nurses, third shift, you know, basically the theme there around cleaning and what it's going to take to do that. Uh, there were lots of questions around will the board provide PPE? Um, the use of outdoor learning uh, classrooms is something that, that folks figured that we should explore. Um, you know, starting the school year virtually uh, and then, you know, reevaluate later on uh, once schools open in the fall. Um, and this would know, be a common theme kind of back and forth. The protocols for screening temperatures must be created. School supplies should not be shared. Uh, ventilation, and I think they, they, you know, it's great from Tiger Team 1, which they talked about the ventilation systems being very dated, causing concern, and then the need for social and emotional learning. In Section 2, which is continuity of teaching and learning, uh, certainly the safety of students and teachers um, rose to the top. I mean, that was an overall theme that you kept hearing over and over, no matter what, bottom line, make sure that we're ensuring that the safety is number one and well-being. Um, there's an overwhelming response there that in some capacity that, that parents feel very strongly that school should start in some form. Um, some parents feel that they should have the option that best meets their individual needs. Um, teachers should have the option uh, if they want to be able to teach in a hybrid or virtual. Um, Obviously, we've, you know, this is a theme from before. Uh, we recognize that what we did in, in March uh, needs to look different in the fall as it relates to virtual learning, if that's the way that we go. And I think that you're gonna see uh, from our secondary principals that have done a great job of what that's gonna look like, which adds a little bit more accountability on a teacher as well as the student side. Again, concerns about special needs, uh, career and technology education in a virtual or in a hybrid, what would that look like? Um, and again, the importance of that virtual learning in, in the spring is going to look different than it will be in the fall. Uh, again, just around virtual instruction has to be robust, uh, looking at the way that we deliver that, expectations for teachers. Um, you know, just recognizing that there's lots of issues that are facing families, and they wanted us to hear that loud and clear, communities, um, flexibility with child care. We heard that over and over again. Uh, ensuring that student voice was heard. Um, again, more and more around social emotional support um, for not only students but families, we heard that. Um, teachers with children, uh, how to ensure that kind of balance between their responsibilities as a parent and their responsibility as an instructional um, teacher. Again, clear expectations. Again, this goes back to the expectation of what it was like in the spring to what it will be like in the fall. Uh, ensuring that, and it's great that an overwhelming theme was around equity, ensuring that all means all. I think that's a powerful statement that we heard from our community. Section three, which is in grading and reporting, you know, some of that feedback was around, uh, again, experiences that folks had in the spring, um, making sure that grading is equitable across, there's clear expectations. Uh, again, teachers held accountable, students held accountable, um, the need for professional development with our teachers. We heard that loud and clear. Um, and then testing. And what does that look like if it's in a virtual environment to, sh to say, um, ensure that there's not only validity, but there's, um, there's no cheating, there's academic you know, honesty. So those are some overwhelming. And again, in section four of social emotional, again, more need, more recognition of both the student and the staff needs um, in supporting that, that uh, social emotional, the recognition that teachers need professional development that as well, equally as it does to be able to teach in a virtual environment. Um, crisis information, you know, more support for school counselors, again, mental health. Five in, in the technology, certainly we recognize that co connectivity is an issue, especially we heard that from our communities within the North. Um, Chromebooks, we heard a lot that, you know, folks were thankful um, of the foresight from the district administration and uh, the uh, county commissioners years ago to be able to fund that, you know, set us up in a really good situation, continue to do that. 
um, the need for the platform, the virtual learning besides Google Classroom, and then as this board has recognized with our learning management system. Um, and then six, ensuring again that there's a safe learning environment, mentally, emotionally, physically, for everyone, for our school administrators, for our teachers, uh, for our, our students, loud and clear a theme. Um, the mindset in shifting best practice in online, that's, that looks a little different. That looks a little different for an administrator on how to give feedback in an online environment. We recognize that. We recognize the need for ongoing professional development. That was a theme. And then again, constant communication uh, is, is a theme from our community to be informed um, along the way. Thank you, Ms. Faluski. Uh, just want to um, reiterate that last bullet. Uh, one of the themes was um, communication is key to keep everyone informed, no last minute surprises. But I just want to publicly state that sometimes last minute surprises cannot be avoided because we give the information when we get the information. It is just the environment that we're in. So I just like to make sure that everyone is aware of that. So next we'll talk about some guiding principles and these are just overarching themes um, that we uh, guide our work by. And one of course is that we need to make sure that we are ensuring the health and safety as well as the well-being uh, you know, of our students and our staff. Of course, that's first and foremost. We all possibly uh, just got finished hearing Dr. Salmon and, and uh, Governor Hogan speak about reopening of schools. And the first thing that Dr. Salmon mentioned was about ensuring, you know, the health and well being, the safety of, of, of all involved. So that is absolutely a priority. Delivering high quality instruction to students, you know, regardless of the de uh, delivery model, whether we're talking about face-to-face -face instruction or virtual instruction, um, there's quite a few differences from, you know, the spring. I just like to repeat that we were forced into the spring without a plan. Um, it sort of happened overnight and, and, it, and it looked like it happened overnight. We did get better in some places. We did a better job than other places. We recognized fully recognize the need to make some improvements. And I believe that we have uh, done that in a proposal, but make it clear, let's be clear, that we will continue to have public input uh, in the continued planning and development. We're gonna continue to make sure that we focus on equity, ensuring that all means all. We want to be sure that we are optimizing the use of our resources. And when I say resources in this event, I mean resources in terms of spaces and materials. But I'm also going to add human resources as far as that is concerned. Um, and of course, fiscal resources are a part of that as well. So as um, Ms. Pullen comes forward to speak about uh, Tiger Team 1 facilities and operations, let me just preface, preface her um, comments by saying that what our teams have done for Tiger Team 1 and Tiger Team 2 is they uh, made some recommendations, as you know, last month, and they have gone back, they have looked at public feedback, all of the community responses that they had, they looked at that, and they are going to make some recommendations tonight for our, the reopening of our schools based on the data that we have available to us at this point. Now, just like we all heard uh, Dr. Salmon and Governor Hogan share some information that was new to all of us, superintendents get the information um, during the press conferences, just like the rest of the public, we have no special priority to get advanced information. That does not happen. Um, and we respond to it. We, we plan ahead as much as we can, but sometimes changes will be made. I say all of that to say, that we are making recommendations this evening based on the information that we have available. Should the governor, should Dr. Salmon, should the health department, should the CDC change guidelines, change restrictions based on public health, then our response will follow. So this is based on what we know, the information that we have right now. If something changes next week, we're going to have to respond to that. If something changes right before school starts, we will have to respond to that. What we believe that we're gonna put before you or what we will put before you tonight is our, our best recommendations. They will include face-to-face -face as well as um, a hybrid. So what we know, we, or what we believe that we can count on is regardless of how we start, whether we start face-to-face -face or whether we start in a fully virtual model, 
there will be some time when we are likely to have to go fully virtual. So we have put some safeguards in place to make the transition smoother. We are grateful that we now have a learning management system. And so that transition will be uh, so much smoother in comparison to what it was this spring where we did not have a learning management system and we're not easily able to pivot between face-to-face -face and online instruction. A lot of that is contingent upon the professional development that begins next week with our learning management system. Uh, we will also provide professional development for our families so that they understand how to use the learning management system. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, of things that will look different from the spring if we are in a virtual model or a hybrid model. So I'd just like to preface all of that um, and, and then invite Ms. Carla Pullen, our uh, project manager for Tiger Team One Facilities and Operations to share recommendations from that team. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. Kane. For the record, my name is Carla Pullen. I'm the facilities planner for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And along with Maria Lagaris fellers the school health services coordinator, we have served as the project managers for Tiger Team One. With me is Mr. Sid Pinder, who is the chief operating officer for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Uh, this evening, I do wanna share with you that the recommendations for Tiger Team One for facilities and operations are remaining consistent with what we presented to you during the last meeting. The CDC recommendations to maintain six feet of social distancing has not changed. And our emphasis continues to be on the utmost safety of our students, of our staff, and on their families. We also want to make sure that we are employing strategies to help keep the virus transmission as low as possible. What I do want to provide for you tonight is some further clarification on what our recommendations begin to look like as we start to implement them. We are currently <clears throat> following the CDC guidelines for transportation capacity, um, and it's limited to, to for public health. If you take a look at the picture we set up, we have on there what an actual bus would look like using balloons for students. Um, right now, we are looking at a uh, capacity of a bus, a 72 passenger bus of being nine to 12 students, max, all right? Nine to 12 students on maximum capacity for a 72 passenger bus. Can you hit that? Um, we looked at, we currently have a two-tier two system. We looked at having a three-tier system that I'll get into in a few minutes. We've also looked at uh, staggered arrival and dismissal times, and then also enforced student walking zones. And actually, it's, it's a non-transport zone is what we kind of refer to it now. Um, I, we, we've spent a lot of time on the transportation part and really uh, have analyzed every single piece of information we can, and we have spreadsheets everywhere. Um, the interesting part to note is, as a school system, we're tasked with how can we transport the maximum amount of students with the limited resources to school? And then how can we maximize the student learning spaces when we get them there? Now all of a sudden, we're being asked to, how can you minimize that? The total opposite thinking of going from maximum to minimum. We currently have 79 uh, contractor buses that are 66, 70, and 72 passenger buses. Don't let that number fool you when you hear a 72 passenger bus. That's based off of three students per seat for 12 rows. I'm, I'm here to tell you, you will never fit three high school students in one seat. Um, you're looking more at uh, a bus ridership of 50, 48 to 54 students on a bus. With that being said, um, looking over, we have 5,258 seats that are available on our buses, all right? So if you really look at that and you narrow it down to 4854, realistically, you're looking at about 3,600 to 4,100 seats that we have to use. At times, do we put three students in a seat for elementary? Yes, we can get away with that, but we try to stay away from that. But if you're sticking with the CDC guidelines, six foot distance is going to be very, very tough for us to accommodate. Um, and we've gone through, we looked at our ridership for elementary school buses at averages about 76%, middle schools about 74%, and 
In high school, as you would imagine, it drops down to about 55%. Um, it is a little bit higher at Queen Anne's County High School just because of the more rural area. But we truly do not live in a metropolitan area where we have sidewalks that students can walk from. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. The other major hurdle that we looked at, we don't have the information for pre-K or K students yet. I mean, they're still enrolling. So the numbers I'm basing everything off of are what we had from last year. So those numbers are gonna skew everything that I have in here based upon pre-K. And remember, three of our schools have a half day pre-K program, all right? Um, the other hurdle that we face, a lot of students uh, come from blended families. Um, Mondays and Tuesdays, the students may go to dad's house on a, another separate bus. They may go to mom's on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and on Fridays, they may go a separate bus to uh, daycare. So you're looking at three different buses. If we were to institute, you know, going back with uh, nine to 12 students on a bus, each student would have to be assigned to one bus. And that would have to be that particular bus. That is gonna be a tough task to overcome with, you know, parents working and things like that. Also, the other problem is when we look at the information that we're given at that time, some students may go to daycare. All right, so even though we're looking at the numbers on here, mom and dad might have decided, hey, we want to send the child to daycare. Is daycare even open? Um, we, we have, you know, buses that just go particular one daycare and, and are full capacity when they leave there. Um, the, the other hard part is we have homeless students that were required to transport um, by federal law. We also have students that we transport all the time between Ken Island High School to um, Queen Anne's High School for CTE. We have the fire school. Um, we have special needs buses that are transporting various schools within our systems. Sometimes there may be a pre-K special ed program that is at Ken Island Elementary School, but the student we're transporting lives all the way in Kingstown. All right, so it's not as simple as we just switch that up um, and make those go along. People kind of have the false image that the buses drop students off in the morning, they're done for the day, and then they come back at 2.30 and start back up. That's not true at all. I mean, it is, we have buses going throughout the county and state all day long. Um, we've analyzed every bus route that we have, um, and we have um, spreadsheets. We even looked at siblings that attend the same school who, per CDC guidelines, could ride in the same seat. All right, we identified 956 seats where that could happen amongst all of our schools. Um, we also looked at our non-transport zones that are one mile radius um, for elementary students, and then also 1.5 for secondary schools. And those non-transport, again, you know, imagine Sellersville Middle School or elementary, we're saying 1.5. There's limited amount of sidewalks that you're gonna get to to get there. So basically, those parents would then be responsible for taking those children to school. Um, now, with that being said, um, we were able between the siblings sitting together and then also um, the non-transport zones, we identified about uh, 1,900 seats that we could rearrange for that. Um, the other areas, and I don't wanna get into the other Tiger team, but as I mentioned earlier, pre-K, at Mattapique Elementary, Ken Island Elementary, um, and Centerville Elementary have half day. Those students would have to go either all day on A day or all day on B day. I would not have buses to transport in the middle of the day. Um, we simply don't have enough. We did spend quite a bit of time on seeing if we could go to a three-tier system. And again, remember I said we're trying to maximize how many students are on a bus. The reason we have a two-tier system is we can have half the number of buses, but transport double the amount of students with that. Going to a three-tier, basically, in theory, your high schools would start at 7.30, your middle schools would start at 8.30, and possibly your elementary start at 9.30 in the morning. Now, with that being said, to make that happen is an additional $272,000 that we would have to pay contractors because now you're driving a whole extra tier. Um, the biggest hurdle with this one is, for example, Northbrook. One bus makes about three stops at Northbrook and is at capacity. 
I would have to add an additional um, three buses just to that one area to pick up those students. Um, and just so you have a, something in mind, each additional bus I put on there for a minimum route is about $39,000 for a full year, okay? Um, with that being said, we're looking at uh, possibly absorbing about $745,000 in additional cost in transportation. And I'm just gonna be honest with you, I can't guarantee you that it will work. Um, there are so many variables in there. Um, there are so many um, things that could happen that we're looking at the worst case scenario and the best case scenario. Um, we even looked at if we brought elementary school students back, just elementary, we could do tier one and we could do a two, tier two for elementary students um, and have buses to provide for that. The, again, I don't have the numbers for pre-K and K, but a couple other things to keep in mind, if you listen to the bus radio on a 90 minute delay, for fall or inclement weather, it's a mess of parents remembering what time the bus is coming. So keep in mind that if we do implement some of these, that we are going to have a 90 minute delay for fall. We are gonna have inclement weather. We are gonna have an early dismissal um, for inclement weather. Uh, with that being said, the, the other main concern I have is if we have 78 buses and I have 10 bus drivers that are self quarantine for 10 to 14 days. Uh, I can't, we can operate. I mean, we have substitutes, but it is going to be hard pressed to find somebody that wants to drive a bus where somebody has tested positive possibly for that. Um, I just kind of don't want to paint a, uh, a not so rosy picture, but we have really turned over, over every stone to figure out what we can make to work. And you're looking at some, um, some major adjustments for transportation. Yes, ma'am. Good question. Um, I know in some, a lot of the comments that made by parents was, in particular, the high school parents that, you know, you let me know if buses is a problem. I'll make sure my kid gets to school. Um, have we done um, an actual, we haven't had time to do an actual survey from people to say, would you take your kid to school <sighs> if you can have them in school? Uh, you know, because I've got parents that would say, you put them in school, I'll get them to school. But I think, you know, we may as a small, it's a lot of work, I know, but as a small county, there may be places we could actually get an actual commitment to get them to school and then they're off the list. And, and Captain Kelly, should the board decide that um, secondary students are going to come to school face to face, we are absolutely counting on that public commitment to get students to school because we do not have the capacity to manage transportation if secondary students come to school. So part of, uh, and we'll get to that when we get to team two, but part of that comment is related to that and we'll, we'll bring that up at that point. Thank you, mm -hmm. I know the parents have- Yep, we, we saw it and, and we would absolutely have to take them up on it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've been very concerned that the more we try to make it work, the compounding effect of cost. We don't have the money for it, so I don't even know why it's a matter of consideration. It really, and what is uh, another factor, is trying to fit kids in and having one transfer to another, uh, the disease. I, I, I don't see how that stops if somebody gets uh, connected with uh, the, this virus. And what if, because of all these complicated schedules, a kid gets missed and they, we can't find them or her? No. I'm not voting for anything that even remotely resembles what we just talked about. I, it's just too much risk. Uh, but I'm glad it was really researched down to the minutia it has to try to make it work. And I think it's beyond our capability to make that work. And even if we made it work, where are we gonna get the money to find it? 
So we appreciate that comment. Um, and, and that is a challenge. That is a challenge. That's but I do want to respond to the original question that you had said, so why would we even, you know, consider it? Because you have to consider it. Exactly. We, we absolutely but wanted to, to um, get out. the public, right, get the public's feedback, find out what the public wanted, and then put a plan together and, and try to make that work to the best that we could based on public feedback. So that's why we went down, went down that road. <laughs> But we, we definitely have two um, models that we're going to share with you for each elementary, middle, and high school. And, um, and, and we'll share what we've come up with. So if, it, if it's all possible, can we hold off on questions, just write them down, and let the, time, let the folks go through the entire presentation, and then we'll go back and have, if you don't mind. I agree with that, and I think we should be open-minded about it, but I think it's in paramount to get these kids at some level back in school, either on, on not, not all the time, but at least one or two days. So, I mean, there's two views of this, not just let's, one. Let's get through all of the recommendations first, if we don't mind. I want to make sure that we don't don't make money a showstopper. I want to know what the realistic cost is when we get to that point, and I have no problem with us going to the commissioners and saying, we would like this money to be able to open not up the school. Well, let's... And so I think we... It's not, there's nothing uh, there. Okay. Might be well, open. So, so unrealistic. Okay. No, we need to know the numbers. That and I'll say that is a uh, a low number that I gave you. I mean, it could go higher. I'm just telling you the facts that we we came up with. I will say this: you, uh, Mr. Smith was talking about getting um, certain groups back to school. If if we go with an A A B B day for students, all right. There's not going to be anything occurring during the middle of the day. I won't be able to transport CTE students from um, Ken Allen High School to Queens County High School. If it is a virtual platform, then I do have buses that I can transport with special groups, CTE, students who are welding, students who need hands-on, um, maybe some 504 students that need to go, um, students who may not have internet access. We can then use those buses to kind of meet the needs of different populations. So I mean, there's there's a lot of arrangements we can do with that. Um, but it, like I said, it is, and I've talked to most of my colleagues across the state, and you know, it, it's not just a Queen Anne's County situation. It's a something everybody's facing. So well, it's something you didn't address, and I'm sorry to bring up sure. a comment, but you didn't talk about cleaning between. We have to clean these buses in between the students being on there. That's about a 15 If you do an AABB day, you're talking about cleaning. Okay, that's my last yep, comment. Sorry. Let's get through this. So thank you. <laughs> sorry. Yes. So moving from transportation to classrooms, following the current CDC guidelines, we are still at six feet of social distance, which equals about 50% of our building capacity. So we are looking at 10 to 13 students per classroom. The photo that you see here, courtesy of Fairfax County Public Schools, shows what a typical desking layout in all of our classrooms will look like. In addition to what you see in this classroom, we're asking that only laminated items will remain on the walls, and this is for ease of cleaning and sanitation. We're asking to remove any type of carpets, any type of soft seating, collaborative tables that are used very often by teachers, and this will represent a change in how especially the younger classrooms are used to operating. And again, the goal is maintaining, sanitizing, maintaining that cleanliness and the ease of doing so. <coughs> so in the classrooms, 10 to 13 students per classroom, that will be their cohort group. And we would imagine that they would travel throughout the day together. We would have no shared supplies, or equipment. We would do the physical distancing between the desks as shown in the photo. Use of face masks except when eating. All employees also required to wear face masks when in the building. We would ask that frequent breaks for sanitizing and hand washing are built into the schedule. At the end of the day, everyone takes all belongings home and brings them back to minimize any type of contamination that could occur. Breakfast and lunch will occur in the classroom and we'll be doing enhanced cleaning and sanitation on a daily and a weekly basis. And before we leave that slide, 
just so we know how things work. And earlier I said, sometimes we have to respond to information as we get it. So at five o'clock, we heard the state superintendent speak about all students, right? And all staff will wear masks. Our original plan, as you see, notes grades three through 12 for students, all staff, but grades three through 12. So with the state superintendent saying all students, that would be a change we would have. That's a prime example of how these things work. It happens and we respond to it. We had a plan, but on a dime, we have to pivot and that's the environment that we're in. So thank you, Ms. Pulling. Go ahead. So that is the the bulk of the presentation that we have. I'm happy to answer questions now or let the following teams continue to present and then we can be available for questions. So because we have um, a lot of your work is contingent upon team two work, if you would just hang out for sure. us, we'll have team two come on in. They'll present their information and it will likely all merge um, toward the end with some, some questions and answers. One will play on the other, and, and I don't want to get ahead of team two. So team two, I know that they're listening. You come right on in. Um, as, as team two comes forward, um, I would like to, um, to mention that we'll share some, some uh, recommendations, two models for each elementary, middle, and high school. And what I'd like everybody to, to consider is just exactly what happened. You change on a dime, as information comes in, uh, we will make adjustments to that information. It's important that everyone recognizes the um, absolute deliberate uh, thoughtful process that has gone into making these recommendations. And let me just share with the public, uh, while I have two of our administrators here, they all were very, very concerned about all of the recommendations because as educators, we want to make sure, number one, that our children are safe. Um, but we also have to be responsive to our public. And so you're going to hear a combination of safety first and responsiveness to public, to the public um, and, what they, and what they want. So um, go ahead, we have with us uh, Ms. Farnell, principal for Centerville Elementary School, and of course Ms. Welch, principal for Bayside Elementary School, who are going to talk about the um, recommendations for the elementary model. Good evening, thank you. Good evening, thank you for, for having us. Um, and we are here to speak on, on behalf of the elementary principals um, on the work that we have done recently in examining kind of in depth the hybrid model that Tiger Team 2 originally uh, recommended, um, as well as the full virtual model. So we'll talk through what expectations and supports we have for students and staff uh, to make improvements for um, that if we have to do that. Just one personal uh, disclaimer as we're asking and answering questions, I am hearing impaired. I do have my hearing aids in, but please make sure that it's nice and loud so that I'll be able to address the questions. Thank you. So the choice of model, um, whatever we end up doing is going to be highly dependent on a variety of factors, which many of you have discussed. Uh, which include our ability to transport students as well as the current state and local health guidelines. Um, we will be prepared to move to an all virtual model uh, based on state or local decisions about closures, closures as a result of the increase in COVID-19 spread. Um, this first model that we're going to talk about is a hybrid blended uh, virtual learning model where we would have about 50% of the population in face-to-face but we want families to have the option for a virtual only format given individual family situations and once the schedule and reopening plan is released. So that is important that we feel um, families asked for and we should provide them an option. Uh, transportation times are gonna need to be adjusted as you, you heard um, previously to meet individual school needs. Uh, it's important, and this is for face-to-face -face instruction or virtual, um, even during our traditional schooling pre-COVID, um, special ed and EL services will be scheduled throughout the day, and of course would be a collaborative effort between classroom teachers, special educators, and English language teachers. Um, there are a variety of things, as we've talked about, to remember about 
system logistics that we would still need to answer as far as transportation and classroom capacity, um, the number of families who want to send their students back face to face or want to continue <coughs> virtually, and of course staffing considerations. So the model that's on this slide is uh, the AABB hybrid schedule. So again, dividing uh, elementary population into two groups, cohort A and B. Um, it would rotate on a schedule where Monday and Tuesday, group A would attend in person. Uh, Wednesday would be a, um, asynchronous learning day. And group B then, that cohort would attend on Thursday and Friday. As we talk through this schedule, it's important to remember that this would not be operating on a full day schedule. We would have to have a some sort of limits. It would operate probably more like a delayed opening schedule on one end of the day or the other in order to make this work. Um, teacher planning would happen either prior to uh, student arrival or after student dismissal. Um, there would, would be, however, a consistent amount of time for each content across uh, the elementary schools, and this would have a tiered approach for, um, for timing as well as, as transportation in order to get 50% of our students in. Um, and so you can, if you look at the schedule for the day, um, there would, we didn't put specific times in here because they would be different based on which tier we were working on. Um, but basically they would have arrival and breakfast. There would be time laid out for reading Angli English language arts instruction, unified arts, uh, lunch and recess, which would look a lot different because lunch is gonna happen within the classroom, um, math, science, social studies, and then time for interventions, enrichment, class meetings, and then dismissal. So all of those things would, would happen within a condensed version of the day. Um, and then on that Wednesday, it's important to remember that that would allow time for proper cleaning and sanitizing of buildings, um, other things that would be happening that day. It's not that students wouldn't still be learning, but they would be virtually learning that day. Um, but it would give time for staff to have professional development, um, for individualized student support, maybe for some of those um, special groups um, could possibly um, be addressed that day. Um, so this is just a breakdown of what potentially that AABB hybrid schedule would look like. Um, noting on there that the pre-K is to be determined. Um, Pre-K is a whole nother issue that we'll talk about in just a second. And I, I believe this is also an option that the secondary considered. So with pre-K, there's been a lot of discussion on the various models for K to five students, but pre-K has kind of been left out of that discussion. As you will see, as we talk, it is its own entity and has a lot of moving parts and is very different from school to school that you go to. So before we talk about options for pre-K, I wanted to give you a little bit of background information on how students are selected and how each school was set up so that you can see the, the, the differences around the county. So during their registration process, there are three tiers of students. Our tier one students are automatically accepted due to their income eligibility, due to their special education services other than speech or if they're homeless. Um, these students, these tier one students, we are mandated from MSDE to serve these populations of students first. So they are accepted or selected automatically, number one. The second tier of students get selected based on special education as well. Perhaps they are speech students that could have been itinerant. They could have been serviced through child fine, through infants and toddlers. They also could have scored lower of a 75% or lower on the academic um, portion of the assessment when we did our in-person registration. And then once tier ones are selected, the tier twos are selected accordingly. The last tier of students are our tier three students, and they are the last to be selected, of course, and they are the students who scored well on the academic assessment of a 76% or above, and they are not income eligible. These tier three students are also typically good peer role models as they are selected for the general education pre-K classes, um, which is usually on a lottery basis. And they're also selected as typical age peers for our blended programs at some of the schools, which I will get into on the next slide. Okay. 
So this slide, can you make that one more time? Here's the title. I don't know why the title's not there. This slide, um, first of all, let me go back for a second. You're going to hear two different terms. You're going to hear preschool and you're going to hear pre-K. So our pre-K students are four-year-old by September 1st, and they are in the general education classroom of 20 students or more. The preschool students could be our very special needs students, and they are our three-year-olds, which was a new program for Centerville Elementary School this past year. So this chart before you kind of outlines each of our schools that has a pre-K, and it also gives you the breakdown of how many sessions, if it's full day, if it's half day, and what kind of programs are there. I'm not gonna read the whole slide to you, but I am just gonna highlight a few things. So some schools like Settlersville Elementary and Churchill Elementary have all day pre-K. Some schools like Graysonville, Mattapeak, Centerville, and Kent Island have both AM and PM classes. So keep in mind that that's double the kiddos. So you have 20 students in the AM, you have 20 students in the PM versus the schools that have all day pre-K service their 20, 20 kids all day. Some schools have regional programs or classrooms set up to service special education students with a variety of academic and or physical or health needs. These classes take on a blended approach and we do that so that we can meet the state expectations of having students, all students, in their least restrictive environments. So this is where some of those um, typical aged peer model selections come in so that the blended classrooms can have 50% requiring special education services and 50% your typical aged peers. These classes, because of some of the needs of our students, are smaller in size, so they're not 20 students. We limit them at a max of 14. So we have seven who may qualify for an AM class for special ed and seven who are typical age peers. And still going on here, some of the differences, some schools have three-year-old classrooms, um, Centerville Elementary School, Sutlersville, and Kent Island. And these three-year-old classes look very different. So Sutlersville's class is new this year and they are going to serve as probably their tier one students and it's going to be all day. Centerville Elementary School has a half a day program that is a blended approach. So we have the 50% special ed and we have the 50% for your typical aged peers. And Kent Island also has a three-year-old special education program. So with all of that in mind, which is a lot. I told you it is its own entity. The recommendation on the next slide will service all tiered students, tier one, tier two, and tier three for both AM and PM sessions. So I need you to follow me for just a moment because the explanation is a little intricate when we break down the general education classrooms. So on A days, the AM students would come to school. That's the Mondays and the Tuesdays. But I need to break this part down a little bit. So as I said before, in the AM and PM session, you have 40 students. So on an A day with the AM students, half of the AM in each class would come on one A day, and the second half of those students would come on the second A day. The PM students would come on B days, and it would look very similar to that as well. So to break that down, the preschool general education classroom, those students would attend face-to-face -face once a week in the schools that have an AM and PM session. The schools that have all day pre-K are in a little bit better seat to service their students um, more frequently. Now our preschool special ed students, our preschool threes, our preschool fours, because their classes are smaller, will be able to be seen twice a week on the AABB day. Are there any questions about that? I know that's a lot to digest and take in. Yes, How sir. is this different than what we did at the last year? At the end, when we went on uh, this virtual, this didn't go on last year. 
this and that it was all it was all virtual last year because because due to the crisis teaching that we were in we couldn't bring any students in the building this is an effort to see so all at, of our students face to face so even at that young age we had a system to communicate virtually absolutely it it absolutely and how much satisfaction did you have in its results for last for last year so it's very, it was very difficult because you know our, our pre-K and our kindergarten students did not have um, devices, first grade or second grade did not have any devices. So a lot of the learning was asynchronous. Um, a lot of the learning, our parents are working, they were teleworking, it was hard to get on live, uh, you know, to be in that synchronous moment with that. So we're hoping that through the learning management system, through having all of the families from pre-K to 12 with an email, with a um, um, login password, that they'll be able to tap into some of the live instruction that's happening. It may not be synchronous because parents are working, they might be using their devices, they might be using a sibling's device, but in that ability to, to record what's been happening, they will be able to see some of that instruction on a recorded level. I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> if, if parents responded that they are working, then there's a problem with working parents th three days a week. Absolutely. So in our elementary leveled uh, conversations that we had last week, um, it was brought up, and this is out of the box, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but somehow incorporate our daycares into the system you know, if they can tap into some of the live synchronous instruction that's happening, it might take some of that burden off of our working moms and dads out there I, with some of that. I think it's going to be hard to get the kids to wear face masks. It, it just, I'm sure that they will, and then a reason will come that they won't. And then a teacher is going to have to be running after them with uh, an assortment of cleanup things and new masks. I mean, it, it, this is a problem. It's a lot to consider, yes, sir. It's a lot to consider. And if somebody tests positive, then that whole cohort then gets sequestered somehow. We'll share um, model um, one. We sort of took them out of order, but we, we have to share the uh, most complicated one first. Yes, that's so, certainly the, that's the more one. complicated one. Although um, model two, in which we talk about complete virtual learning, um, we'll kind of talk through now and with the understanding, as it has been said, that you know, we learned a great deal in the spring about virtual learning and about what works for kids. Um, and we'll you'll hear uh, some of the expectations that we talk about for, and, and supports also for students and parents. One of the overwhelming themes, I think, of the parent survey that has gone out and the feedback that we've gotten is that there's a need for more connection with that teacher, um, whether they were elementary or whether they were high school. Um, there's a need for more of that um, synchronous instruction when possible and just the ability to connect with the teacher. Um, and that is, is what's is lost. Actually a big difference between last year and this year. The emergency started after the teachers had been more than familiar with their students. Now, every student has either graduated or moved up. So, unless they know them from some other way. Yes, that is, is a no new hurdle because they already had those previously established relationships with that class. And that that is going to be a challenge. Um, There's a way of Mr. Solving Anderson, it. Mr. Anderson, can they get through the? Yeah, but then I'll forget. <laughs> write it down it, it is a good question and, and one that that uh, I, I know principal an special idea, elementary talked about yeah. all right so um, these are the expectations that um, we discussed for teachers students and parents um, for virtual learning and noting that many of these expectations also um, relate to the hybrid model also because part of that is going to be virtual um, we know that um, teachers, um, we want them to connect with students daily through check-ins and or teacher-led instruction. We want them to deliver instruction through live and or pre-recorded sessions. Providing feedback on assignments is important. We want them to connect with students and parents during 
office hours or whatever their time is during the day um, to do that, to communicate with families using phone, email, or other uh, forms of communication. And we want them to be able to respond to parent and student communication and concerns within 24 hours. We understand that students are expected to log into Schoology, the learning management system, on a daily basis to receive teacher-led instruction uh, and to access and complete assignments. We want students to, uh, or expect students to complete assignments by established due dates to maintain academic honesty and to review feedback received from teachers. We also want students to, and expect students to attend reg regularly scheduled check-ins with teachers and to contact that teacher with questions about assignments. On the parent side, our expectations is that we ask that parents review school-specific schedules for distance learning when they are established, that they utilize Schoology to monitor their students' learning, that they support, support students with timely submission of assignments, that they reach out to teachers with questions and concerns about academic issues, that they contact counselors with concerns about social emotional issues, and also that they review um, school and QACPS messages that come out. Um, that being said, we're going to talk a little bit in a, in a minute about support for parents because that's also a, was a key theme um, in the feedback that we got and we know that um, the parents are an important group that we need to support um, through either one of these models. So looking at a schedule for, again, completely virtual, um, Monday and Tuesday um, and Thursday and Friday, both all four of those days would begin with a class meeting and then there would be established times for each uh, academic area um, as well as unified arts, interventions, enrichment, small group instruction when appropriate, and social and emotional lessons. Um, in our virtual schedule, Wednesday is still a completely asynchronous learning day. Um, we felt that it was important to continue to provide that time for individualized student support, as well as time for teachers to collaboratively plan and be provided with professional development because we are, we recognize the fact that they need, our teachers need the support um, and to make sure that they can teach virtually as, as best as we can uh, equip them to. Any other comments about that? So in our recommendations for um, maximum time per day, we um, have increased that from our expectations from the fall. Um, and again, these are recommendations by grade band for um, maximum time per day for pre-K. We suggested one hour, grades K to one, uh, an hour and a half, grades two and three, two hours, and grades four and five, uh, three hours. And that would include their direct instruction, synchronous engagement, as well as their um, follow-up activities and independent work. So for our virtual learning recommendations, um, we want to remind you that this is just a sample schedule. Uh, times and schedules would be adjusted for each respective elementary school to meet their own needs. However, the time frames for content areas uh, and delivery of instruction should be consistent across all elementary schools. Again, special ed, um, English language learners, and intervention um, services, um, those times for those special needs groups would be scheduled throughout the day and would be done uh, in a collaborative effort between the classroom teacher, special education teacher, and content specialists. One thing, um, if I may interject for just a moment, one thing to keep in mind, you know, particularly for the primary students or, or pre-K to five, is that it will look different as students need their parents' help to log in, to, to do the live instruction, to do some of the independent work in whatever form that that might look. And that schedule sometimes may not yield for parents to be a live synchronous component, but using that LMS system and able to view um, recorded sessions um, may help with some of that. But just that, as, as was mentioned on one of the surveys, that we really have to keep in mind you know, parent schedules and, and where they are and, and work in communication with each other. So other recommendations uh, and considerations that we wanted to discuss that 
as I mentioned before, we feel it's very important to provide parents those learning opportuni opportunities and guidance to support their children at home. Um, we're going to have a new uh, learning management system that staff, students, and parents are going to be learning together on. But we also want to be able to provide them support with the, how to get into the student account, the Gmail account, those types of things, and other things that are specific to uh, their particular level, like the Wonders program, um, some of the other platforms that they might need um, based on the level of student. Yeah, the foundations program for uh, pre-K, K, and will be first grade this year as well. And then we're hoping that like the learning management system, the Schoology, which is um, countywide from pre-K to 12, that there would be some support by central office um, to ensure a consistent message is being delivered to parents on the island, to parents at Southersville, to parents um, here, so that they're getting the same type of instruction. So eliciting their support on that would be would be very helpful. And and I think we need to kind of work smarter too. So for example, if if Teresa's gonna create a video or screencastify to help parents learn how to log into the LMS, you know, why wouldn't we create one for the for the county? Maybe elementary might look a little different, but you know, I think there are some things that we can have some support from uh, central office and kind of work together with other other schools uh, to make things smoother and make it consistent. Um, we do want to mention that, you know, paper packets still may be needed to be used on a very limited basis. Um, we felt the need for um, that we have to have procedures for distribution and pickup um, following CDC guidelines and knowing that this needs to support current uh, content learning expectations so um, that, you know, these paper packets are going to be used in, you know, only when when needed, um, but that it shouldn't be a review. It should be new new content. Um, and we know that there are, I was very glad to hear um, the governor and state superintendent uh, this evening speak about expanding um, the broadband in rural areas, which I think would be very helpful for us. But we know that that's, that's a concern, particularly in um, some of the rural areas of our county. Um, we also want to note that it's it's very possible for us to bring in those small groups of face-to-face -face, uh, instruction for individual student needs groups while still following those CDC guidelines. Um, there are some of those students that are just bottom line. All students are going to do better face-to-face, -face, but there are some students whose needs are such that um, virtual instruction is nearly impossible. Um, and we recognize that for those students with um, with those needs. And we also ask that we have staff allow um, allowed to work remotely in their school building. Um, teach, many teachers have asked for that. Um, we don't want to require that because if, if it's virtual learning, I think there are some who will have a, a medical need to not be in the school, but we want them to be able to work from their teaching space if they so desire, and we can do so safely. It's familiar to them. They have resources at their fingertips. They have their you know, clear touch boards or their smart boards that they can work from and create a safe place for them as well. They may appreciate that. Well, following that trend, I, I was going to ask, um, given with the virtual learning, the teachers could contact these new students as Mr. Anderson had brought up, you know, they have a new cohort coming in. You know, the fifth grade moves to sixth grade. They, they don't know these, these students. So going through the Schoology, they would be able to, Schoology, they would be able to meet the, te meet the students, meet the families, you know, through virtual and, and get to assess them, they get to know them, that way they have some kind of trust built up. Um, I, you know, they already knew them at the end of the school year, so um, it, would, it would be helpful for the students to know who, you know, this is my student, this is my teacher for this, this is my teacher for this. Just um, familiarity. Yep, and, and absolutely. That's Building possible. relationships. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I have no doubt that our teachers will come up with creative ways for them to um, to establish those relationships and, and build that trust. Um, we're just going to have to think outside the box. I assume that the idea of the teacher and the family meeting on a Zoom meeting. I mean, this is used in college recruiting of athletes and so forth. It's very personal. Uh, the teachers are talking back and forth with parents and the student present. Uh, 
The problem is if a teacher has 100 students, uh, you know, it's going to take a little time to get that done. But if they know the names and the contact, uh, a reach out might work. Sure, that's correct. And it look, could look a little bit different at the elementary level when you of only course. have about 25 kids, but certainly um, I think we can find some creative ways to, to make sure that we begin to establish those relationships. People make some big decisions uh, based on, a, on Zoom because that's the only way they can find out what's going on. That's right. That's right. Anyone else? I had a couple questions. You said that they work from their space. They're, they're teaching their students. They're teaching half the students. On Monday and Tuesday, and they're teaching Wednesday, Thursday, or Thursday, Friday half. So, and it's being projected virtually to the others, the half that's not there. So they're in their space. It could be, but we that on that last option we were talking about would be full virtual. So even if if we had to go full virtual, um, we have many staff members who have um, requested that they have the option to teach from their their classroom, their teaching space, even if if 100% of the kids well, were I home. Would think they would. When would they not teach from their, why would they not teach from their workspace? People have immune systems. Immune problems. compromise. Know, but they're in their, if it's all virtual, nobody's in the room but them. So. That but they may not feel comfortable going into the into the building at all. Right, and it's going to depend upon health restrictions, right? So if we're able to have people in our buildings, and you know. A required number uh, capacity I'll put it that way then we'll follow that so th there are a multitude of reasons why we didn't do it in the spring and why some teachers may not want to do it in the fall if we open fully virtual yeah. just like there are a number of teachers who have already requested if we do open fully virtual may I teach from my space in the classroom right I mean I would think that would be the norm is my point yeah. Because as well, there are other extenuating class, circumstances. Correct. That's there are other extenuating circumstances that they may have at home with their families too, yeah. which I think we need to be flexible to consider. I, well, I received quite. two emails from teachers who asked to stay at home because they have loved ones, spouses, parents, and themselves who have uh, immune compromising uh, sy sy you know, system problems. So they don't want to have to go into the building and they don't want to be forced to. So there are extenuating You're talking, spurs, you're talking about it. Extenuating first. Extenuating first. Uh, I can understand that they have a health immune system and it's, it's documented and all that. But I would certainly think both as administrators and stuff, if your teachers were in the building, they can get more support. They can get more help. It's more structured. Yes, some of them, but I think I would like to see us lead off that our staff would be in the schools and work if some of them cannot be, I understand that for certain okay. reasons would be documented, but the majority would be in school, so they'd have support both of you, of principals, of special people, and if they got overwhelmed by teach or emails, they can have, maybe have somebody support them with some, you know, other things. I would just think is it would be a lot easier dealing with your, you know, and they'd have their own personal space, their own room, but then you'd be able to fluctuate and to keep them, not an eye on them, but they'd have support there, just not at home where they're not set up to do that. That's kind of what I was saying. That is their workspace. So, I mean, that I think ideally that's where they could be. And, and I guess. Correct, but it complicates things when they have school aged children also that they depended on school for those children to. And so we have some families that are trying to, which they, I can speak for Bayside teachers, did very well this spring. They taught their own children and taught their class of children simultaneously. So. Um, I certainly understand your point. I just think we need to be flexible with, uh, mm -hmm. in, a, as flexible as we can be in a, in a difficult situation. I think so. I can't agree with you more and, because it's hard, but the, feet, the feedback I'm getting from parents is they are having to work out babysitters on their own when they go back to their work. So just be aware of that. I mean, Understood. I would love to be, you know, but if, it, if it's a matter, they have complaints about it being a matter of babysitting. They need to be home, take care of their kids, and how are they working with my kids? Just want to make you aware of that. And I've heard that from multiple parents. Not to be cruel, it's just that they're both working. They're all working on their work to make arrangements for for babysitters. So I'm just trying to throw that out. I'm, it does, I don't mean to sound heartless. But that's a concern of the parents right now. Why are we trying to accommodate that if if it if it interferes with them teaching me my students? because they're getting paid.
Well, we, we certainly recognize that the um, their job is is to teach, not not assign and review and all of that. So you know that's a change that will happen if we end up going fully virtual. Uh, but whenever there's an opportunity for us to make an accommodation for our teachers, we want to be able to do that. Um, and and I think that's important for teachers to know because we do recognize the difficulty in having to teach. Um, you know, do your job, and and you've got. Uh, kids at home that you can't get daycare for for whatever reason. So I think that the flexibility that you're speaking about is critical, but I do understand from a parent perspective, and I would think that as a, a, a parent, if I couldn't get daycare for my kid, and if my job could find a way to help me through that, they would want that as well. Um, but I understand both points, points well taken, and, and thank you. What other questions did you have, Captain Kelly? And if, if, the, if the parents are in their room, well, I don't think that has been an option. I, I, well, I just think I'll, I won't speak to that because I don't really make those decisions. But I, I think we need to be careful about bringing school age children into Absolutely. the environment if we're not allowing all students to be in in the building. But that's again not my decision and beyond my. Okay. And, and, yeah, decisions. we're following guidelines on that one right. with the capacity for the buildings. So. But, but along with with Captain Kelly. And I sympathize, and I think as administrators and principals, you have to look out for your employees. I think it's a, I think daycare is a big issue. I think it's a big problem. It's going to be even a bigger problem next year. But, you know, families face the same thing. And I think good businesses will try to work with them, but some families don't have options because they don't have the daycare. We're a rural area. There's not that much daycare in this area. If your child is at daycare, how can they virtual learn? Because that daycare is probably not set up to do that. So I sympathize with the teachers, but I... I just think, you know, everybody needs to get back to work as much as possible, which allows them all to be sympathetic to everybody. But let me tell you, parents are home trying to find daycare and instructing their children because they're having to pick up some of the slack that we're not doing. So it's, it's a, yeah. I think, it's a big issue. Can I also preface this, I mean, end this okay, with, um, just to add to the co conversation, we want all our staff to be safe. That includes our paras and our subs, you know, our, our secretaries and our custodial staff, anyone who does any kind of assistance to the system. I mean, I want them all to feel safe in our buildings. No matter if we're, if it's virtual or if we're at hybrid or whatever, I want everyone to feel safe. I just want to put that out there. Okay, thank you. I have two more on that. Sure. Um, the pre-K to three, not to omit them, but was there any thought given and if you couldn't accommodate tier three because they can afford it and they're they don't have to have a pre-k i'm sorry i mean i was in that spot and uh yes it's great to have a lottery but but if that would be would it help you on getting the ones and twos more if you didn't have a, a three yes yes that is an option um several options you know have been explored and that was one of the considerations because uh, msde as i said before mandates that we service all of our tier one with that said we want to get all of our students in and getting in those tier twos and those tier threes is a it's a it's a bonus and i i don't want to make anybody angry when i when i say that because we want to get all of our students in we want to give them the best learning experience possible but yeah, that there could be other options. Yeah. yeah, and the last one is, um, why do we have um, these limited max times per day? Um, because teachers are getting paid for a full day. I'm, I'm, I sound cruel. Teachers here. will be I working for a full day, certainly. But they've um, got 90 minutes with the child um, for K to one. Why do we limit? Because that that, that is what we feel is pedagogically correct for that age level. For the, for the chill, for the yes, that's not teacher work time. That's student work time. When so maybe if you chart. explain what other responsibilities that teachers will have throughout their regular work day. Well, you're looking at a first grader who may not have the attention, attention span to last <laughs> more than an hour and a half. But the teacher is still working. The teacher is doing still... office hours. I'm sorry to jump in there. No, I asked you right. and, and then I, I jumped in there. Too. So the teacher is doing office hours. The teacher, and that's responding to parents and student questions. The teacher is doing some small group tutoring online. The teacher is doing a regular, his or her regular planning. Um, so the teacher is still working their full day. 
but and they probably are going to be recording additional lessons that they you know need to record to respond to tutoring and individual student work uh, needs but the teacher is still working the times that you see are student online uh face to face I didn't understand and, that. Mm -hmm. and i think because if you yeah i'm teachers sorry. you know a regular work day and we're not in covid they're you know, they, aren't they teaching most of the day? They, they are. I, I think if you if you talk to a, the average teacher, whether it's elementary or middle or high, I think you'll find that comparing their workload between face-to-face -face teaching and virtual, it, it dramatically increases. The, the planning and preparation dramatically increases for uh, virtual learning. And, and certainly we had a learning curve this spring for us to, you know, we kind of got thrown into that. Um, but I would say that I can speak for many of my teachers, and I'm sure Mrs. Farnell can, that they Absolutely. worked well beyond seven and a half hours a day. No, yeah, I'm not trying to hit their no. workload. Um, it, it's probably more important in high school. I mean, there's no re you know, if you're going to be teaching somebody and you're teaching, you've got a plan to teach for, for a day, you wouldn't be limiting the teacher. So I'm, no. This is a student, right. and that was Correct. my question. Mm -hmm. And you would also have the teachers, um, maybe they have their small groups going on where for 20 or 30 minutes, you might have a third of the class, a, th a third of the class, or a third of the class. And two, with this, as we move, or if we move into a virtual um, situation, students, particularly primary, even, even yes. pre-K to five, I would say, need some of that hands-on interaction. So they still need to have pencils and crayons, and they need letter tiles to manipulate as they're working on maybe their independent work. That might not reflect the online time, but they still might be working on some of those activities that the teacher has provided to support some of that synchronous instruction. As they actually would be doing in his classroom. Yes. Or, or, Cor I correct. Because you correct. got them on their own in the classroom that time. Correct. Okay. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, ladies. Anybody else? We're good. Thank you for coming in. Thank you, Thank you for all your time. Um, Thank you. But don't don't leave just yet. We want to make sure that uh, we have um, secondary, and if there are questions, then we want to make sure that we are able to come back at the end. Um, that we didn't respond to. Back. But Thank they've you. got um, nice little cozy spaces where they were, okay. so that we're respecting the capacity for the room. And Mrs. Bass is going to go grab our secondary administrators. Thanks for wiping that space. Um, our secondary administrator, so they can talk about recommendations for uh, remote learning and face-to-face uh, -face learning at the secondary level. Can I, can I ask, uh, does anyone need to take a break, just a 10-minute break? Is that all right? We, we start, yeah, sure. We can. Is that all right? 10 um, minutes, Mr. Jeff. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. Please. Right now. Go ahead. Maybe after
So thank you to Mr. Schreckengas, principal at Kent Island High School, and to Mr. Kenna, principal for Stevensville Middle School, who will share with us the recommendations for secondary, for middle school and for high school. And just like the elementary principals, we encourage our principals to speak freely. They're gonna talk with us about some recommendations. And I'd just like to say once again, that we have recommendations for our last board meeting. And we asked our principals to go back to the table with respect to the public comment uh, for face-to-face um, instruction for secondary students and to see what model might work. Uh, there are some challenges with the model for face-to-face -face that our principals are going to talk about and I encourage them once again to speak freely. Uh, we may or we may not be able to solve some of those issues but we certainly want to make sure that the board and the public is aware of the research, the thought that has gone into um, this work to ensure that we are doing the best that we can for all of our students. So with that, I'll go ahead and I believe, Mr. Kenna, are you up first? Yeah, and if, if you'll indulge me for two minutes, I would okay. like to make some comments about the process and what we went through to get to where we are tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, for those watching on TV, Mr. Strait, is this the camera they'll be looking at? Yep. Hey, students, um, we want you back in school as soon as possible. That makes some of you happy, some of you sad but we're all working very hard to get you back here in the building as soon as it is safe to be here. So some of you are happy, some of you are sad. Uh, we hope to see you soon, all kidding aside. I know there's been signs out there and you've gotten lots of messages from us, but uh, all the meetings with the principals last week were desperate to be around you guys again. So we miss you and we hope to see you soon. On that note, I would like to just tell everybody that I was pretty proud of the process that we went through with the principals last week. We had several days where we truthfully just locked ourselves in a room um, and we began to pour out all of the obstacles and all of the things on the table that we needed to talk about for all of this. Digital learning, different models of hybrid learning, all the things that we had learned from the spring and that had been on our minds since school ended. Um, I'd say we entered that room with about 18 distinct challenges. Some of them, uh, I walked into that room myself, and I'm going to kind of put myself on stage here and say, one or two of them, I thought, there's no way we're ever going to fix this. It's just not fixable until we're back in school. But because of the collaboration and because of the willingness of that group to listen to each other and share ideas, this one included, we solved some of those things that we thought were unsolvable and we came up with a lot of solutions. It looked like a, like a war room in there. We had two LCD screens going, three whiteboards going. There were arguments, there was debate. It was heated at times. Uh, there were times where people were up walking around their chairs, arguing with each other. But at the end of the day, I think the professional discourse that happened in that room allowed us to knock that list of 18 down to about five or six. Um, and I don't, I don't want to sit here and represent like we solved everything in those meetings, but I am very, very proud of what we accomplished there. And I just want to say thank you to the principals and to the supervisors and academic deans who participated in those meetings to make that possible. Without all those ideas and without listening to each other, uh, we wouldn't have been able to get as far as we did. On that note, if you'll indulge me for one more second, I do want to talk a little bit. Um, I'm going to hinge off of something that Dr. Kane stated earlier in the meeting. Um, about what's coming up. We're, we're pretty sure that at some point, as Dr. Kane said, we're going to need online learning, whether it's in a hybrid model or a full-time model at times, depending on how rates go and all that. So part of our time that we're going to discuss here this evening is how we try to sharpen that up. As you know, the end of last year was not ideal. That's been addressed a couple times here tonight, but I'd just like to paint that picture one more time. On March 10th and 11th, we start hearing rumblings of, hey, get ready, you might need a plan, you might have to get out of here and teach online for a couple weeks till this stuff passes, was the thought at that point. About 24 hours later that we heard, you're gone on Friday. Pack up your rooms, get out of here, you'll be out of here temporarily. And I want everybody to stop and picture that for a second because the teachers had to up and leave their rooms. All the stuff they use, their environment that they're used to teaching in, and they didn't have it. I know you guys know, so I'm preaching to the choir, but I really want the community to understand they had to walk away and it got extended a few more weeks, extended a few more weeks, and then all the way out to the end of the year. And there was a lot of criticism about was it perfect and no, it wasn't perfect. And we know 
But I also know that there's probably teachers and parents out there who would cite a lot of stuff that was great, especially given the circumstances. And I think that we did the best we could to keep the ship afloat. We certainly learned a lot, um, but it was not necessarily the teacher's fault as been pointed out here several times tonight. So as we begin this next school year, with the specter of that virtual learning about ready to happen again, I don't want attitudes to get too negative about that. I don't want our community to feel like, oh, here we go again. As Dr. Kane pointed out already, um, we're gonna be better prepared. We're gonna have better, more than 36 hours notice. We worked on a lot of stuff to get a structure that's going to work. And as Dr. Kane has pointed out, the district is planning professional development for the, t for the teachers and instructional staff starting very, very soon. I do want to take just a minute and highlight one thing that really needs to be said loud and clear here, though, and this was the sentiment of the principals from that meeting, and that's why I'm bringing it up here. Queen Anne's County Public Schools is one of the highest performing school systems in the state of Maryland. We're the envy of the rest of the Eastern Shore and the state of Maryland as a whole. It's because of a supportive community, outstanding kids and families, and most importantly, because of the unwavering dedication of the instructional staff at our school. Here, here. I think that their record speaks for itself, for itself. Our scores, our performance has been outstanding and the teachers will continue to do so. That's not me throwing sunshine. It's not being, me being subjective. Their record speaks for itself. And so with that, we appreciate those comments. And so now to the first model. I do have one more thing to uh, say. Half a second. Uh, and can I take 30 okay, seconds? We're gonna get to what I we're just, here for. I just, want, yeah, I just want to say this because I think it's the teachers that will actually make this better. And I wanna take this moment to say the buzz that's in the community about teachers are getting you know, off easy here. I just wanna take this moment while I'm sitting here to say, it's not right. They've worked harder than they ever have. I've worked at elementary, middle and high school from Southersville to Centerville to Kent Island. And I will tell you, the teachers will be the solution to this problem. The teachers are the one that will make this better. They are our greatest asset, and I will tell you that they all agree, as soon as it is safe, they want the kids back in school too. Most of them have kids themselves, and they know inside the classroom is the best environment. I think those are important comments that are shared by the principals in those rooms that we had over those last few days, and I wanted to make sure they were stated for the record here tonight. Nothing replaces in the classroom instruction, but we did put a lot of time and effort into uh, our vision for what virtual learning may be at the secondary level. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Schreckengoss to start going over that. Good, thank you, and agreed. Uh, Ms. Harper, Dr. Kane, members of the board, uh, we present to you first uh, the, the results of that work that, that Sean mentioned. Um, the leadership of the middle schools and the high schools uh, had two difficult tasks to complete. The first, in response to the Tiger Team recommendations presented earlier in the month, we present to you this virtual plan. Secondly, as stated earlier, uh, very importantly, we were given, we, we had the task of creating, of exploring the, a hybrid approach at the middle school and high school level, also as a result of our community feedback, which has been mentioned. So we share with you um, an example of a virtual plan. Um, we will, let me go, are we going the right way? Guess not. Let me see what I can do for you. Yeah, there, there we go. go. There we go. So I, I believe that the, the former slide was uh, shared and discussed, so we can hop over that. Yeah, we've right. seen this. Thank you. That's what, I, that's what I thought. So in front of you, you have a, a example of a virtual high school model. Uh, and, and I think it's important to point out also that when we say virtual, it's really, it, it is indeed a blended model. It is, is a combination of virtual experiences and um, direct interaction with our classroom teachers. They're not independent uh, virtual activities. They're, it's, it's, it's a blended model with synchronous, asynchronous. We've used those words a lot lately, um, and that is very much reflected in this model. So a couple of key points as you look at this diagram. First, it is based on uh, a seven and a half hour teacher day. I believe that was discussed earlier as well. Yes. This model for both middle and high schools is also based on approximately a three hour and 15 minute instructional block for our students, during which those activities will take place. There will be opportunities 
every day. It was, it, it was, it was very strongly felt uh, and discussed by our group that all of our students interact with all of their teachers every day. They have that experience every day, whether it is a more lengthy, uh, more structured learning teaching time, or perhaps on some days it is a check-in time for it, for a student uh, to check in with our teacher. So that so based on a full day for our teachers, based on a three minute or three hour and 15 minute uh, instructional block for our students. I believe also uh, the it, the high school model has what I believe you discussed also as office hours for teachers in the morning in in the afternoon. And I, I believe you've discussed the activities that will take place during that time. I certainly can get into that if needed, but I believe that that you have a pretty solid definition of what that that means. Would this also uh, just quick uh, their Please. planning time? This would that would incorporate their planning time that they're allowed to have, correct? So within that sequence, and you'll see the same thing. I'll just flash forward to the middle yes, school schedule because no, there's no, not just, a whole lot just, of difference. But no, yes or no question. but in both of those, okay. the sequence of class periods. So a teacher is assigned to planning on like second okay. period. So that would be their planning time. Now the catch there, um, Ms. Harper is that's not an equivalent planning time to what they would have had during the regular school day. Okay. Um, so we may incorporate planning time elsewhere in this grid, but yep, their Sorry, planning I period remains the same. I should okay. question. Sorry. And, and as discussed, there, there are two groups of students to have in mind when you look at these models. Those that, um, uh, well, we, we've gotten into that already. So that, that's a, a, a basic structure. We believe that that provides more structure, a more robust virtual blended environment than we experienced as you've heard. And clearly uh, that was our quest to, to develop just that, a structure uh, that is um, really so needed by all of our groups, our parents, our students, um, and our teachers. So that was the goal of, of, this, of this model. And I think Mr. Schreckengoss that with some scheduled times for reteaching, one-to-one -one group office hours, that helps teachers and parents to get a handle on their daily schedule a bit better. Because as we talked about before, teachers are working over the spring a lot longer than their regular work day because we're electronic, you know, virtual, like your day never ends. You're getting conversations with parents at six and seven and you're still trying to get your day. So this sort of helps to add a bit of a regularity yes. for families as well as our teachers. So thank you for that. Yeah, it's certainly agreed. It, it's an expected schedule. It's, it's a schedule on which you can rely. Yeah. And right. we know that Brilliant. there are certainly situations outside of the regular day that we, we communicate with families, but this helps to sort of regulate it a bit more. And in fact, in our model uh, for students who are watching, we'll be taking attendance during those Absolutely. periods. Absolutely. Show up for class. Please. Just to clarify for me, just in that I've had from parents, um, these is AM, eight, 8 to 10, 15. And then at the bottom, you've got the office hour. They don't have that during the regular school, school day. So why, if we were in the school, they're working an hour and a half for each class. Mm. So I'm just going to ask, why do we have to account for that? And Something is that the virtual thing is why? Something that I did mention uh, as, as we began, another um, recommendation from our, our the presentations earlier in the month were the those staggered instructional blocks. For elementary, I believe it was in the morning. For high school, it was uh, during these times. And for middle, it was in the afternoon. An attempt to spread out the workload within a household. So we stuck with those, uh, within those parameters when we went for our instructional blocks. Also realize that though that instructional time is, that's when that direct learning, that direct instruction is taking place. The expectation will be, and you'll see another slide in a moment, uh, for the students to be working in high school for about six hours a day, which is much, much different. It's about double of the expectations that we had in the spring. So the expectation is during that instructional block of time from, in this case, 10.15 to 1.30, that is the um, engagement period. That's when I am learning, I'm engaging with my teacher. Then during those other times of the day, it's expected that our students are completing that work uh, to that, that they just reviewed and to pre prepare for the next day. Is that what they do on a regular school day? 
Though it is not sequenced the same way, I would suggest yes it is. So if I'm in a 90 minute history class, the teacher doesn't stand there and teach for 90 minutes. Rather, there is some direct instruction and then learning activities that go with it. In this model, the direct instruction happens and the learning activities that the students are doing outside of that window still equate to roughly the same time, but in a virtual model, you have to rethink. It's not a 90 minute block that's all right there. It's, it's important to note too what Mr. Schreckengoff said, and I wanna make this very clear. Our team um, looked at, the secondary group of principals looked at trying to maintain that recommendation of elementary first, high school second, middle school last. If you look at the middle school schedule, some people might go, well, this is ridiculous. Middle school doesn't start until 1225. But to your question, the assignments that the teacher and the learning and, and all of the activities that a student would work on from Monday are going to be theoretically occurring on Tuesday morning. So you're ready for class on Tuesday afternoon when you show up. So similar to a regular school day in the number of minutes, but where they spread out is different because that's this virtual model. In a, and, and I think this may help answer your question as well. In the event that we decide to abandon that and just say first period is at eight o'clock, no matter whether you're middle school or high school, then the window for US history in eight o'clock first period class is 90 minutes. And that kid has that time to get that teacher instruction, do their work and move on. We, in this model, we're trying to honor the recommendation that was made from a previous board meeting. Uh, we're not all sold that that's even helpful or necessary, but at the moment, that's what we're sticking to. It is very easily amendable in here, and all of the secondary principals have already discussed that. Right. We're ready. And, and it also represents best practice for virtual and distance learning. So it, it's not as if in a classroom. So what, I think we, we made that point real clear when we had this, uh, when the situation came up in the spring for distance learning, distance learning is different. It is not face-to-face -face learning. In a face-to-face -face situation, a 90-minute block, the teacher is given direct instruction for a period of time. Kids are interacting with each other for a period of time. They're doing individual work for a period of time. The teacher can literally walk around, conversate with students, monitor what work is being done. This isn't that. So we have to reframe our thinking about what happens during distance learning. Well, that's my question. That's what the, that's what the people that don't understand how you all came about this is why isn't the teacher online with the students and and doing their doing their lesson that they have on at every all the time first period here's what I do with my lesson. The teacher so, is going to teach. The teacher is going to be online teaching. Every, every day. Each day. Every it was every a day. requirement that we wanted. We want our kids to see our teachers each and every day on the screen. And then in some cases, those smaller times where it's a small group or tutoring can happen in those hours outside of it. I believe what the conversation we're having here is a function of we were pigeonholing middle school into this three hour window high school into this three hour window, because if we could expand it, then you could say U.S. history, first period, whatever you have, if it's U.S. history is from eight to nine, nine fifteen, whatever. And the teacher explains it and does stuff and gets in the class. Either way, the new LMS, which we're all going to get trained on, but it does promise to offer uh, an opportunity for. So when the teacher says, now go away and work on this activity, I, as the teacher can still be in the class because I can go right into your document. <coughs> If you're having an online chat or discussion with a couple other students in the class, I can just jump right into your discussion just like I could walking around the class. Honestly, for everybody to hear, the first week of that probably won't go perfect because we'll all be learning it, but as soon as we have it under our belt, it's a very valuable tool that will allow the teacher to be in the class virtually. That, and that was the expectation from all the parents that talked to me. And they feel that's the only way to make this successful in their minds for the student to get what they need. Mm -hmm. And the high, I'm talking the high school, well, middle school too. Yeah. And we're we're open and ready to shift those times. Those are example times. If we decide that, let's just let's just hold a school day to feel like a regular school day and not go with that recommendation. We can shift to that. But for right now, okay. we are honoring the recommendation that came from the board meeting last time.
question from the board of from the presentation last time? Yes. Yes. Okay. I have two observations, and I, I'm sorry to bring this up. Um, one is a lot of parents are, have, over the course of the years, tried to push back the starting times for high school and middle students. Mm -hmm. They have asked for extra time for them to sleep. This definitely lends to that. Interesting opportunity, isn't it? Yeah. Secondly, I see where the, the high school ends at 1.30, middle school is pretty much gearing up. For those families that have multiple students in their homes, where they only have one device between them or only enough right. connectivity for one device to be on at a time, this offers that opportunity. And I think that was the model, though the conversation in our group very quickly went to, that works if you have an elementary, a middle, and high school kid. Yes. If I've got a fifth grader and a sixth grader and an eighth grader, I've got two middle school kids and now it's still chaotic for me. So it's one of those things where sometimes we're trying to solve a problem and we might have actually made it worse. It, it, that's one of those things that we'll just have to choose and go with by the August 14th plan deadline. Okay. But we're ready to go either way. Okay. We'll make it work. Sorry, sorry. No, it's okay. Sorry about the questions. So if you want to talk, the next slide is about the uh, recommendations for times. And I know, Mr. Schreckengosh, you had mentioned something. Yes, I mentioned this earlier. And those numbers reflect uh, double the amount of time that our students were expected to be engaged in learning from the spring. Uh, so I mentioned that earlier, and that slide depicts the new times um, up to four and a half hours for, for middle school students and up to six hours for high school students. It doesn't include homework either, does it? No. That's just instructional time. Oddly enough, too, Mr. Anderson, uh, just as a side note joke, uh, almost everything's homework in this model, and that was something we kept coming up to, like, all right, we're just not going to assign homework, and the room went, I guess everything's homework. Well, let, let's here. just to be clear, <laughs> everything is in homework because there is actual instruction that will be happening. Um, it is working at home. Correct. I want yes. to make sure that was clear. <laughs> Correct. Okay. So you're going to talk about the hybrid? So we looked at a couple uh, different hybrid models. Um, the one that has been selected for us to share tonight is an A week, B week model. And we'll, we'll tell you why. Some of those big remaining challenges that we were left with um, that truthfully were, some of them are outside our, our, our purview as principals. Uh, transportation, I know you heard about today. The one that, I guess the next two are probably, we'll, we'll take 30 seconds here and run over them because it is a pivotal part of secondary education. Number one, secondary transitions, um, socially distanced secondary transitions are quite a hurdle. It might be the biggest hurdle that we as principals tried to overcome. It is not that we can't get kids to behave. We think we can. It's not that we can't get them to follow norms. We think we can. The problem is when a class period ends and even as few as 10 kids come to that door, they all leave that door and go in their own separate directions. There is no common path of travel. And unlike elementary school, we are not in cohorts, which means that the next classroom is shuffled and there's a new cohort in there line three, the class would need to probably be cleaned at some point, and we're not experts on how that would work, but we know it needs to happen, which is another hurdle. Um, we talked a lot about that. It, it, as again, it's probably outside of our purview, but that that's definitely a consideration. If I have 15 kids in a room, and they've been in that room for 15 minutes, or sorry, an, an hour, touching the desk, touching all the stuff, we've got to clean it before the next group comes in. Who cleans it? And probably more importantly, where do the children go for that 15 minutes? Uh, Mr. Schreckengoss was famous in our meetings for saying, the longer you leave them out of the classroom, the closer they will get together. Um, so it's, that's definitely a challenge for us. Uh, we discussed teacher coverage issues uh, for teachers who are not able to come in uh, or when teachers got sick. Again, something out of our purview, but it is a, an issue for us. And mask requirements. Um, as secondary principals and administrators, we kind of thought about what happens if a student says, I'm not gonna wear a mask, and what our procedures would be for that. With all of that considered, we <coughs> had several options. The one that limited these issues the most was the A week, B week model. Uh, if you look at this model, uh, this is the middle school A week, B week. It is nice and clean because there are five periods in a middle school day and there are five days in a week. What happens here 
is a student comes into school, they go to their first period class, they stay in their first period class until about noon, and then they go home. And on Tuesday, they do the same thing for second period and third period and fourth period and fifth period. There's a downside to this. That's not the best educational psychology practice that we can think of. Most adults would not do very well sitting in a classroom for three and a half hours, not moving. And let's be clear, when we space those rooms out six feet apart, a lot of the things that we did to make learning fun and classrooms fun can't happen. They gotta go in, they gotta sit in the seat, they gotta stay in the seat. It does get them in, it does get them with the teacher, it gets them in once every 10 days to see their teacher for three and a half hours. Another caveat that I will put on this that all the principals were concerned about, some of our secondary teachers are still adjusting to how to effectively teach in a 90 minute block and we'll be asking them to teach in a three and a half hour block. It is probably the best option we could come up with and the most significant issues it removed for us were there were no socially distant hallway transition issues and there was no classroom cleaning in between classes. It took away both of those issues. Instructionally, it is probably not a great decision educationally. We'll, we'll do our best to make it work because a lot of what we're coming into is we're gonna do the best we can to make it work. And I'm sure our teachers will do a good job if this is what is chosen. So A group goes the first week, B group goes the second week. So mm -hmm. every other week they're not at school. Correct. Correct. Which is why school needs to end at noon so that the teachers have the afternoon to support the virtual learning students on the other side of that bubble. And plan. Yes. Yeah. Which it'll be a tremendous amount of planning. High school is very similar, but Mr. Chuck. Yeah, high school is very, very similar, although for the most part, our students are in a four period day. Um, so the Friday becomes a little bit different for us. We, uh, we're continuing to explore options for Friday, though uh, the one idea that we left our meeting with uh, was a rotational. So we would go periods, as you can see, Friday we would have period one, the next week we would run, so it was almost a 10 day cycle. The fifth day we'd always switch so the students would have an opportunity to see that teacher twice um, and at the, the, throughout the course of a semester it would all equal out. So there's, there's still elements of this plan uh, to flush out, that being one of them. A question on that. If, you're, if the teacher is, if they're in class, say a period one, and the teacher's teaching, would you think of them running a stream and, and and teaching virtual at the same time? Is that what's going to be happening or are they doing a whole second half of the day with virtual? The design that we came up with is that they would support virtual learning on the other half of the right. day. Streaming into the classroom um, honestly would be something that we need to get feedback on teachers with. I have some hesitation on that. Um, and I would, I would want to talk to teachers because I may talk to teachers and they go, no, no, it's no problem. And I'll engage the class. And, but that's not something that we explored any further than that. I, I, I think the point of this was to get the kids in with the teacher as often as possible. As you can see with this list of challenges, it's the one that yielded the shortest list of issues for us. Um, it, it's not ideal, truthfully, all of the options that we considered are a little stickier at secondary than elementary, simply because, and don't ever forget it, we don't move around in cohorts. Every time that bell rings, we shuffle. And so this was the only model that stopped that. And there's gonna be no perfect plan. What yep. we gotta do is what's the best of what conditions we have right now. And, uh, even though probably teaching that long a time, I mean, I would want to sit there for three hours and listen, not maybe to you guys, but not most <laughs> other people. But, you know, it, it does give them the time to get there, see their teachers. And like you said, the second half, I don't think they could really virtually learn and teach a class at the same time, because it's hard to have a Zoom meeting with more than four people when you get right down to it. You know, it's tough. But I, I, my biggest concern with the live stream of the classroom beyond maybe some privacy issues that we'd have to consider as well. If I'm a teacher, I can't classroom manage you from your living room right? Uh, while I'm dealing with my kids in class. And, and that's, a, that's certainly a significant concern for secondary teachers. So, um, And the teachers probably come with some innovative ideas if they're with students for three hours. There's gonna be a few little 
tricks everybody could learn to. And Mr. Smith, I agree. And I, I, as I've started the presentation by saying, I have full faith in our teachers to mm -hmm. make anything work. I, I'm very, very proud of our teachers in this school system. I do just want to keep pointing out though, this model, even though we're presenting it to you, it, a class, the, the, the tools they would normally have at their disposal to interact with kids, regroup kids, have stations around the room and do fun stuff that makes kids want to come to school. They're not gonna be able to because we got to put them in six feet apart desks and basically keep them there. At you least, at least they're them in there school. until 1230. We would have them there until 12 o'clock. Now, let, another caveat on that. We did not collaborate with transportation on exact times on that. So that's just a window of time okay. that we would in a model like this would have to be flexible based on transportation. So it's. And the transportation issues would be make to that third tier. Where we'd yeah. be running buses probably every hour if we had elementary middle and high school running so have we um addressed have we even considered if we went to virtual what would happen with the cte students would you allow them into the buildings because i'm hitting questions from the parents about that will you let those cohorts at least go in because they're hands-on mm -hmm. you know the, the cosmetology the nursing the welding the carpentry um, the fire school. We, we agreed as a group that that that, that face to face that hands on time for those specific um, courses is in programs is very, very important. Throughout our conversation, we couldn't overcome the barrier of sanitizing equipment and space in between use. So we we discussed it. Um, and that was a that was a hurdle we uh, that group just couldn't overcome. So that's a no. No, I, I can't. I can't. I can't say that I would agree that that would be a no. Okay. I yeah, think that we right. right. I okay. think that we have had conversations about the special groups, and that was referenced earlier today. Okay. CTE uh, kids that have to have hands on. We have to work that out. Okay. Uh, a Wednesday, you know, rotation or however, however it works. But I think that those children, students with special needs, whether it's through special education, EL. Um, you know, speech, what, whatever it might be, we got to find a way because we can do small groups right now. Mm -hmm. We were reminded of that today. So we, we certainly will work out okay. what we need to do with those special I populations. I think that's what they're waiting to hear. Yes. That's what they are. And well, everybody's waiting to hear everything. Our group agreed. Further work needs to be done with, with, those, okay. with those courses and programs. But we're not discounting them? No. no. Okay, great. Okay, I have a question. And maybe I'm, I'm flashing back to my days of changing classes. So period one, you could have 10 kids in algebra, but period two tomorrow could have 20 kids in Spanish. So how do you figure out that a group is going to be 50% or less capacity in those classrooms, given everybody has different schedules? And only yes. one teacher teaching Spanish. So how do you figure that out? So yes that's very interesting and, and we we actually stacy rankin our academic dean uh really ran those numbers uh to, to determine just that uh we split our population in half by alphabet mm -hmm. uh, so that that created your a uh, group and b group and surprisingly most of the classes are are divided evenly throughout the day so regardless they're, they're, of grade level because you could have a ninth yes. grader taking an AP. That's exactly right. Grade level was not a consideration. It was pure alphabet. Okay. And uh, it surprised us. I mean, it, it took a long time to run that model. Though, you know, we were able to do it. Uh, Stacy did it and proved that it's not perfect. There are courses that will, there are classes that will have to move around the building okay. due to uh, some of our classrooms are, are larger than others. Uh, some of those considerations, though, difficult. Possible. Okay. How do you work the ninth Great grade? Great question. That's like nice. an impressive test. They're all moving work parts. Ninth grade annex issue. Well, transportation certainly becomes, uh, you know, an issue with that model. Transporting our ninth graders over for uh, courses on our main campus, though number-wise, uh, when we split the population by alphabet, uh, again, the, the numbers of students in each room suggest that it's possible within our learning spaces still to be in the yes, ninth yes, grade yes. cat okay yes 
So I think this will be a good time to interject the um, concern that we have for transportation at the secondary level. Uh, we talked about a possibility of a third tier, but if we're going to do our special populations, that's our CTE, special education, EL, uh, those groups, it is impossible for us to transport all secondary students, whether we're talking an A, B schedule for the week or A, B for, for the day, you know, by the day. We are unable to do that. We heard a heavy outpouring from the community to say, even if we have to provide transportation, even if we have, we would, if, if it is the board's uh, vote to go with a face-to-face -face model, we would be coming to the board to say, we need to make some revisions to our transportation procedures because we have a handbook for transportation. We would not be able to transport our children. We would absolutely require uh, that the uh, community step up and transport students because we don't have the capability. Mr. Pender talked about earlier, uh, our, our school systems are designed to bring in the masses. We are not designed to bring in the minimal number of children. So the systems that we have set up just don't work when we can only transport eight to 10, you know, or sometimes 12 kids on a bus. It doesn't work. It is impossible. Um, and, and it also, yes, Mr. Anderson has a hefty budgetary implication. So if we did do a face-to-face -face model, we would absolutely be coming back to the board to say some changes are going to need to be made to the way we are able to transport children. Um, and we would come back to the community and say, we are unable to transport children to schools uh, for the most part, at least perhaps minus some of the secondary populations uh, on a, a weekly basis. So I have a it question is, with that. Not so some of your kids high school level that drive who say, well, everybody can hop in my car and we'll all, is the school going to allow that? The, the, we the, ride the to school together. Nobody right. sneeze. I mean, it depends on the age of the child. Correct. But I, I can hear that coming from parents. Well, this group rise to school together, why can't they all just jump in his truck and go? And, and, and I wanna say, um, you know, we all have a responsibility in the safety of our children, whether they're on a school bus or whether they're in a vehicle provided by their family. We all wanna wrap our arms around children. If it is a parent's decision to pair their child up, I can't say to this parent, unless it's the age requirement, which is the law, I can't say, oh, no, you're not. I can't, I can't, I'm not, I don't have that level of authority, okay. right? Parents have to bear responsibility for the safety of their children when they are putting their children in a vehicle with another child. Okay. Except if the other child has disease, transmits it, it spreads. Doesn't parents it? still bear that responsibility. And we pay the price because yeah, we have to does. shut down we all do. we, everybody yeah. does. I think there's got to be social responsibility and they've got to sit there and you know, this is I think an, is a good plan. It could have hiccups in it and I can guarantee you 10% of people won't like it. Something's going to be because it's not going to it affects me directly so it's not good for me but it's good for you. I just think everybody takes a deep breath. Look at this. This is a plan that we can implement hopefully and some people and some of the public have to take a step up and do some more and help us as long as we're willing to provide to them. And I think, like you said, the teachers are going to take the charge. Our parents need to take the charge. We're living in a different society right now in a different world that we're going to have to do some things that we didn't do a year ago. But it, for the best interest of the students, I think if we can get them back in school, it's, it's an excellent program if we can do that. And the law allows us to. Well, as it stands right now, and as I understand the next steps that we have is that the board is actually going to vote on a plan to reopen schools tonight. No, August 5th. The comments are due July 24th and August 5th. We were going to make our decision. That was my understanding. Uh, so it was, it was our understanding that the board wanted to fast track this. 
Um, so we allow that opportunity. We allow for an action item on tonight's agenda. If it is the board's desire to not vote on it, it's the board's, you have that you know, right to do that. Um, what my understanding was is that there's now crying of uh, requests from parents who want to start to get ready. Um, we had a timeline and we presented that timeline. And as you know, I explained to several parents why we have that timeline and we certainly want to give everyone an opportunity, one, to share their public comment, two, for our teams to be prepared to pivot as we have done in response to public comment. We're about, Mr. P already said it, about a third, a third, a third, you know, about a third of families when kids are back in school, like right now, about a third of families said, I'm not sending my kid back, period. And we got a third of families who are interested in some type of a hybrid model. So, you know, it is, it is, a, um, it is a daunting task, but it is one that every school district, you know, has to make. We want to be responsive to our communities, but first and foremost, we have to look at safety. We have to look at the safety of our children and of our staff. Um, and so we've made sure that we put it on the agenda tonight. If it is the board's desire not to vote on it tonight, we will not be making a different recommendation. Um, so the recommendation that you have is the recommendation that you have. Um, if you would like to delay your vote until August the 5th, then you do that. Um, and, you know, parents will wait until you made a decision between now and August the 5th. But the recommendations are the recommendations. Those will not change. So I have a couple questions, logistic questions. Uh, say we do go ahead and decide to do it virtually. We can still be fluid if CDC guidelines change. If, I mean, the, yes. if, if things change, we have to be fluid in, in how we respond. And, and our recommendation would be if the board decided that we should go fully virtual or virtual for a second, whatever the situation might be, we would put a caveat in there that we're going to come back to the table given whatever circumstances we're under at the end of the first semester, which is the change for high school students, um, so that we can reassess where we are in terms of the health and safety of the community and the, where we are in Queen Anne's County. Um, if there are guidelines that are different, revised from either the State Department or the Governor's Office or CDC or Maryland Department of Health. So all of those factors come into play and certainly we're, we'll be listening to our community. Um, it will give them an opportunity, one, to try out whatever the uh, decision is and offer some feedback, two, for us all to learn it, what adjustments need to be made. So we would absolutely come back after reassessing if it were that, wh whichever it is, whether we are fully virtual or hybrid, we have to reassess after because period of time. Because we could go into a hybrid situation and all of a sudden, you know, all bets are off and we have to do fully virtual. That I is mean, that is, that is which is Which is part of the reason why so much time was spent making sure that we had tightened up what we were doing in the spring because it can't be that. We know that. It can't be that. Well, we so, also and, now, and we're likely to have to pivot anyway. Well, we also now have this learning management system, which we have all seen, or we will see, Schoology is going to certainly uh, expand and, and, and implement better practices, but educational even, practices. Also. If we go to the hybrid and have the uh, thing virtual still on the table, as far as students that don't want to come back to school, they can still do it virtually, right? Yeah, so for students who don't want to come back to school, and, and Mr. Kenna, I think, brought up a, a, a challenge. However, we are preparing to do what I call broadcast classes. So if I am a teacher who has, um, I'm teaching in front of a group of students, we are in the process of purchasing video cams so that teachers can project what they are, are teaching. We could also do that in the learning management system so that the students at home can see. Um, can we do uh, classroom management at home? No, we can't do classroom management at home. But that's why we have responsibilities for teachers, students, and families, parents, caregivers, uh, about the expectations when we are doing distance learning or virtual learning. So uh, there is that opportunity, and, and that is a benefit of the learning management system. Uh, just a, an observation. Um, we have very good people ready to do 
one of three different things depending on somebody else's decision making or maybe a bunch of somebody else's decision making. I think we start doing what we can do and focus everybody on doing it well for a semester. And if events change in a right direction and they stay that way, then make a different decision as to where we go next. Frankly, I'd rather stay virtual until they can come back in the schools and we have a normal system. The hybrid costs too much. Uh, they, it, it's just too expensive and there are too many places where somebody can get sick. As much as we try to prevent it, it isn't going to happen because human beings are human beings. They're not going to do it the same way every time. I count on the people in this room to do it. I don't count on 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, even 17 or 18 year olds doing it every time because they won't do it. You know, I've had kids. We all have had them. You guys have, your, your kids never get old. It's <laughs> <Right>. more set. <laughs> But, you know, I think we need to vote on this okay, to let's, give Let's direction. go around the room and, and just get input from each of the board members before we make any kind of recommendation or but No, I think we point. ought to do it. I'm not saying we okay. do it at this very second. I guess the, okay. we didn't have it as an action item, so I didn't know we were going to vote. I'm not going to say I can't vote on it tonight. Okay. Just Thank it you. wasn't presented that way, and there was some additional stuff I wanted to understand. Okay. Well... Ms. Morissette, do you have any other concerns or questions? I have a few questions. Okay. So if we return to school hybrid or full, all the forms that we do online before our kids come back for the next year, you've got the forms about transportation. Are we going to add forms for those families who want to opt out and virtual learn? I don't want to come back in any form or fashion. How do I let you know that? Mm -hmm. Or I don't need your transportation. How do I change my forms? Yeah, we, we can make those adjustments in um, the registration document. So we okay. certainly can do that. So even those who have already done it? Okay. Yeah, because what we have now is feedback. We didn't say, Andrea Kane has two children at home and I'm going to opt. I, I don't want either of them or I want the high school one to be back and I don't want the elevator. We have not gone to that level of detail. Okay. So that level of detail, we would have to request that information. Okay. So that Along with sense. the transportation need or not need. Well, that's what you just well, said. Well, like I just, I already filled out, what was it, SNAP code or what, what they call it? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I've already done that for the next year. Mm -hmm. I'm, I just like to have stuff done. So. I've already put in what my usual plan is for daycare and the address and the bus and all that. But if I choose, well, I can bring my kids to school because it's right on my way to work. I now need to change that plan. Yeah. Or I want my ninth grader to come because he's healthy and active, but I don't want my disabled child to come because of exposure risk. Mm -hmm. Now I need to change the plans. Here. Correct. And one of the reasons why we did not put that information out ahead of this presentation is because we aren't sure. We, we have exhausted people uh, from getting feedback from them. We put out multiple surveys. We've asked for feedback for the proposed plan. And to ask for one more thing in a short period of time, we just felt like let's ingest what we have. Let's decide what direction we're going to go. And based on that, we'll f figure out what other information we need to get from parents um, after that. If it was the board's decision that we would go fully virtual, we wouldn't need to be asking the question about right. transportation. And so well, we, we thought we'll wait. We needed to ask the question to find out what to do. It's an advisory to find out what the thinking is. It is not what we're going to do because it's a third, a third, a third. How do you decide? You decide what's right. 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 So, yeah. Okay. What else, Mrs. Marsa? I guess my only concerns, I mean, as, as a nurse and what I'm looking at every day, you have one case. You are now shutting that school down for at least a week, if not more. And then certain students are going to be out of school for 14 days along with their family members. So you're still going to be in a situation where you're you're asking people you can't go to work, you can't leave your house, you're quarantining because you now have an exposure in your child's classroom. That that's a concern for me because it's it's not an if, it's a when. It's going to happen. So we need to be prepared for that. And parents need to understand you're asking us to do one thing, but don't be upset when it happens. And now we have to backtrack 
and change the plan or disrupt what you feel should be normal. It, we, we just can't be expected to make 100% right decision when things change so much. Is that the protocol though? If, if a student pops positive, well, we haven't had the school situation has yet. to close. We haven't had a school situation yet, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, look but, I mean, what's happening right protocol? now in our community yeah, with restaurants. Yeah, th one a person. It's a restaurant, not a, not a big yeah, But school. you have 180 it, employees in some of these restaurants who don't work the same shift, but you are now shutting that restaurant down mm -hmm. to clean and test people. For a few days, right? For a few days. Mm -hmm. If Up to you a have week. a school with several hundred children who move around and take this bus and stay for this and that, now how many cohorts of children has that child been exposed to throughout the day before they even felt sick? Because they're contagious through all this. So now you're dealing with more than just this child and their family, you're dealing with every child that child has been in contact with throughout the day wherever in the building and the staff and the staff and, and all they we don't know what camp. bathrooms Johnny used all day while he was here we don't know what door he went in and out of which was part of the um, thinking that Mr. Schreckengast and uh, Mr. Kenna and the team that they work on worked with tried to um, reduce the transitions Right, the number but of times eliminate. a child moves. If somebody right. were to say, I've eliminated it, it, it I'd is think It is impossible. It's, it's to impossible. It. Exactly, and that's okay. the point. Okay, Mrs. Morris, do you have anything else? Any other points? No, I mean, those are my only concerns. And just to, to give parents some notice, I mean, that's the biggest concern we've seen in all the, the letters and the feedback. Give us some notice so it's not on the fly that I'm trying to figure something out for my child. But one of my thoughts was to open school the, after Labor Day to give them additional time to get ready for whatever we decide. No. To give who additional time? The, the system. Parents. Yeah, the only time parents, it's the going to take. Anderson, Mr. Anderson. Definitely the Please. parents. Um, you know, because I thought we were going to August 5th. That if you want to do it tonight, I mean, you, there was not the plan. And if we've changed it, then, um, you know, I was going to recommend that we start school the day after Labor Make Day. Make a motion. To give every, I will to give everybody a chance, to, a little more time to get ready, if they felt like they, you know, depending on what we decided in August. So if you think we can handle it all, if we make that decision today, then I don't have to make that motion, but I was gonna make a motion to that. So it would be actually more than a week if you did it today. Well, here's only because Baltimore County applied for a waiver to start school after Labor Day. So the thinking, is that what you're coming at? Right. The thinking was to start it after Labor after. Day to give an additional week. Because as right now, we have what, Mr. Bluski, six weeks? Uh, you're the, you, 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 there is no reason How many days is it? The clock is ticking. And if we make the announcement tonight, again, five weeks potentially, what, the teachers will be back in the classrooms or start <coughs> PD, mm -hmm. and then starting up August 31st. So that is when mm -hmm. school starts. Mm -hmm. So you were recommending that we well, I, apply for a waiver? I was, yes. A waiver. If we apply for a waiver, are we, how are we going to make up those days? Are we going to just the are we gonna lose year. them? At, add it to the end of the year. Well, what are your recommendations about that? My thinking is that if you are giving parents notice earlier than August the 5th, that's two weeks that they've got to, to think and to plan versus one week as you wait a week and a half to make a decision and then say August 5th and then say, okay, now we want to adjust the school year and oh, and by the way, you're going to be in school a year long, a, a week longer. No. You're giving parents more days notice if you make a decision tonight <laughs> versus if you wait until August the 5th and then ask for a week yeah, uh, that yeah. everybody's going to pay for. At you're the not end even year. giving any attention to the staff whose dates have all been set based on starting school on the 31st. Well, of I'm August. just okay. trying to give additional okay. help to the staff. No. Okay. The answer is no. Mr. Anderson. That's my Mr. Question. Anderson. That's my Mr. Question. Anderson, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Smith. There's no perfect plan. I think that a lot of hard work's gone into this and doing this, like Sean said, it's not the ideal way to teach in larger blocks. But I think you've addressed some of the issues that we can do, and we're all going to have to accept some responsibility and a possibility of this COVID getting out. And, I must agree, it probably at some point might hit us, but 
I think it's a good idea. I like the hybrid thing. I think our students need to get with our teachers. And um, I, think, I think this is the best, I think this is a good plan for right now. I think we'll probably be tweaking it over the next two or three weeks because we don't know what information we're gonna get from the state or what else happens. And I think the um, principals and the educators could probably have a few little things they might wanna do either school by school or hopefully, you know, pretty overall the same. But I, I like the hybrid idea of, of, of having the kids back in school. And the parents that do not want them in school, we still have the option of not being there. You want to finish your conversation now, Catherine Kelly? Yeah. I, would, um, I think part of it, it that is important that we not forget that it's not just a matter of the academics. I mean, we have seen this, I've read a million articles on this, that a big part of a student's experience is also the emotional, the social, in particular in secondary schools, the social impacts of being able to be around their friends. The hidden learning that's not in any curriculum. Exactly. That happens every And, and I day. think we're omitting that. My thought was we'd get a psychiatrist or a psychologist in here to express that because we haven't even brought that up as an important issue. But since we're making the decision earlier, then I, then I want to bring that out, that there, there's concern for that and there are students of some email I've gotten of a person that I knew the family and the young person was talking about you all, a, a student, you all don't understand that, you know, what happens in a home. And if I can't get back to my school, that's my only safe place, my only safe haven. And, you know, I mean, it broke my heart. And I, I, I thought I, I didn't want to ever forget that when I'm making a decision. The decision is about the students. And it's what do we do best for the students? We, the entire student, they're probably gonna get, their sports are probably gonna go away, which is a big shame for the fall. However, if this, this hybrid could impact that mental, social, emotional needs of our students, I think we can work to handle some of those very few things you have left that we need to fix. And if we need an extra week to fix it, um, then I would make that recommendation to expand the, to start after Labor Day. But the big thing is to be responsive to the families. You're right, Dr. Kane. the parents wanna know, and they wanna know sooner than rather than later. And I really wanna give them that chance. I'm up for voting tonight, but I think I'm really big on the hybrid method. And if we've got a time between now and when school starts, when everyone make that, to, to get this hybrid method ironed out to get the notices out and find out exactly who needs to take a bus and to modify whatever meth whatever you need us to modify on policy for the the mile mile distance walking and all that if we we can take those things and try to solve the problems and not you know like you all did you brought 18 down to four i mean we ought to be able to grab in the four and if we find out between now and when school starts, we cannot do it, then transition back to the, the full virtual. I'm very pleased that there's a, a, a robust virtual opportunity here. And I think if we start with the hybrid, see how that goes, and to give the kids some, some time, you know, in the building with their teachers and with their classmates, at least see some of them, I think it would be very advantageous. And then if we get a problem, I think going from hybrid, it's so much easier than transition right into the virtual. Because they're doing virtual, partial, half, half uh, every other week. So I just think that's a great way to start and then the transition after that. Personally, I think the parents are ready for, for the, getting their kids in school and then they're ready to make that change if they need to, and they'll understand if we've made some kind of effort to handle that social, emotional, and mental issue that, that these students are, are feeling. So I highly recommend we can go ahead and vote tonight. I would love to go with the virtual, I mean the uh, hybrid, at least in the beginning, and see what we can do to get it ready, to do it right, and then transition to, to virtual if, if need be. Just a, a caveat, don't forget that uh, I believe it is Tiger Team 5 um, has a plan for the social-emotional um, learning piece um, that has been their work 
over the last few months and um, it is a, a, a robust plan. You can go back to the original plan and see the work that they've done and that can work in a virtual model. So my turn, mm -hmm. please. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Mrs. Morissette, what's the largest age group right now that has increase in COVID numbers? Yes, there's 20 to 30 year olds. 20 to 30, so it's 18. Your late teens into early 30s. Okay, and we've had a 200% increase in Queen Anne's County in this last two weeks? I believe so, I believe that's the percentage. And yes, there is the shutting down of restaurants. Okay. Families, whole families that are now having to quarantine the bell curve hasn't even hit yet. We're not, we're not flattening out in Queen Anne's County. We are flourishing, blooming in cases right now. Multiple restaurants closed last week, multiple closed yesterday. I spoke to Dr. Seattle and myself about this issue um, because we have a lot of concerns uh, with our own staff and, and other people, families. Um, I'm not, um, you know, I don't have any kids in school, so I'm not invested. But what I am invested in is their education and the equity piece. And we have all people, everyone has to have high quality education, virtual or face to face. I'm not willing to risk it for someone's life. And I, I'm not, I know that's not popular um, opinion or decision. Um, I would like to see us start with virtual to be safe. If we can transition October, November, when the, you know, the, when it flattens out and it's safe for everyone to go back into these schools. And I mean, safe for everybody, staff, teachers, anybody who touches a child, not touches, excuse me, I'll rephrase that. Anyone who helps with the education of our children and the children and their families, we have to make it safe. Um, I would recommend starting with virtual and then transitioning whenever to the um, hybrid model. And hopefully by January, you know, we can all get back to some kind of, nor some kind of normalcy. Um, but that's where, I, that's where my thinking is at the moment. So at this point, I would entertain a motion. I'd be happy to make one. I move that the Queen Anne's County school system open uh, on the designated date of August 31st, 2000, the school system with the teaching system in place at the end of the last school year, which is the virtual, the improved virtual and continuing for one semester. So we have Mr. 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 I have a motion. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Mr. Anderson, would you like to speak to your motion? Okay. Uh, I think if we have something that the teacher, the staff, and the parents understand is going to be in place, it clearly defaults to the health and safety and welfare of all concerned that these very capable people can concentrate on fixing the aspects of virtual and not be distracted trying to do other things. So we can be prepared to hit um, uh, August the 31st with a virtual training that's better than it was the last time. Uh, I, I think uh, we've heard from members uh, with great concerns. Thank heavens we have such great leadership in our school system that checked out every piece of can we do this or we can do this better, et cetera. The transportation, which is the biggest problem with hybrid, it's a, I don't know where the money would come from. Maybe we'll find a way later on at, uh, at some point. It should stay in place uh, for a semester. So parents know that it's going to be, this is what it's going to be. And it starts on thir the 31st of August for semester. If something comes up, that gives us a, a hope that we can return the kids to school where they want to be and where we all want them to be. Then we just put it on the agenda, hear from the health department, hear from all uh, the stakeholders and decide what best to do at that point. Okay, anyone else? 
I'd say just the opposite. I think we need to have our children back, and I think we've done need gentlemen and ladies have done an exceptional job on putting some programs together with safety and the health care in mind of what's going on. Is there a risk? Yes. Is there a chance something could go wrong? Yes. But I think our kids need to have some face to face with our teachers, and I think it's just better for the school system, my my personal belief. And my thing and probably Mr. Smith saying the word risk is is key. I think there's as much a risk for not putting them in school in my mind. I think you really need to get them in there and get them in front of people and around their, their teachers and around their, their friends. Um, they are they are still, you know, they've been out of school since mid March. Thank goodness some working out happened because they've all turned into slugs in all honesty especially at the high school level. I really think it's important we get them back on a, a schedule. We get them into the school and say, oh, this is my school. And we, we give it a try. You all did a great job getting this ready. I'm, I'm thinking a lot at the, at the secondary level. You did it, and so did the elementary, sorry. But you all did a terrific job. And it just seems like you've covered every base that we need to think about. And, and we've got another one five weeks or six weeks to get this set and to, and to tweak some of those issues. And I think we need to give it a try because it's so easy, I think, to go right into that virtual plan, which is well developed also. If, if, they, if they've done a little virtual and a little um, in the classroom. And, and as far as the transportation goes, you know, once we know exactly individual who needs a bus ride, then we can get it to the bus people and see what they can work out. Uh, because uh, multiple parents said, I will drive my kid if it gets them in the school. So I just think it's important that we take that into consideration. And the parents, the ones that are bombarding me, want to get their kids in the school. And school systems are doing it, bigger school systems. So I think we ought to give it a shot. I think we're a small system. We should be able to handle individual by individual. We have 7,500 kids. We don't have multi-thousands of kids like a lot of these systems have. And I think we need to take that, make that effort. We could be the good example for how this could work by, by in, in being innovative as what they presented and to try this, this um, hybrid, just give it a try. Um, to give the kids a chance. Anyone else? Yeah. I, I Mr. Would, Anderson, I, wait till everyone has spoken before you speak again, please. You're the only Ms. one that had No. Mrs. Morissette, oh. you want to speak again? Um, I was just wondering if we could modify it to a quarter instead of going a whole semester. So you would like to... The, the reason why we were thinking a semester is because of the high school students are um, graded in their, their uh, courses are semester courses. Oh, okay. Okay. But is that a showstopper then? I mean, for consistency, I think that we, um, you know, we presented to you uh, what we thought w might work. Um, the motion is for two quarters, which equals to a semester in a high school. And, and that was intentional okay, because of the way okay, high school you. courses run. Okay. But that would be two quarters would be a semester. Correct. I mean, right. Correct. Elementary to high school. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, no other. So what is our motion? Is that for a, a semester or for? It was a semester. For a semester. So um, hearing no other comment, you know, comments, discussion. Mr. Uh, Mr. Anderson, I, would you reread that for me? I think this has me? been mentioned before, but uh, four counties have already announced that uh, they're starting virtual, but there are much larger counties than, than us. Uh, Prince George's, Montgomery, Howard and Harvard. Washington, Carroll. Uh, and others are falling in Caroline. line, not taking the risk. Caroline's already. Uh, and Dr. Kane handed this out that the representatives of the, the teachers associations have universally recommended uh, that we be very careful with uh, uh, implementing something that could cause uh, teachers to become ill. And I, nobody wants that. So. Anyway, that's all I have to say. So I call for the vote on the motion. Can you reread your motion, please, Mr. Yes. Anderson? 
Uh, I move that the Queen Anne's County school system open on the designated date of August 31st, 2020 with the teaching system in place at the end of the last school year, which is virtual uh, as we are changing it and continuing for one semester. I call for the vote on the motion. I'll do a roll call. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Morissette? Yes. Mr. Smith? No. Captain Kelly? No. Yes. Three to two. Motion carries. Thank you all very much. Is there anything else for this evening? Thank you, Mr. Schreckengoss. Thank you, Mr. Kenna, and Thank certainly you. to Ms. Welch and Ms. Farnell uh, and all of the teams that worked on this, um, as the deans, the, the specialists, um, you know, of course, our supervisors and everybody who worked on this, a tremendous amount of work. And, and I'd like to note your, um, and some might think, am I using the right choice of words, but I'm using the word that I intend to use, and that is your courage for coming here to talk tonight about this because I know that there was a bit of concern about, um, you know, the vote. And, you know, clearly we're going to have community members who support the vote tonight and we will have community members who do not support the vote tonight. Uh, I believe that it is, it certainly is our administration's um, desire to keep all of our students safe and to provide certainly a much more robust virtual program that we had in the spring and we will work diligently. I want the community and the board to know that to ensure that it is exactly that. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for your work um, and thank you for sticking together um, to do the right thing for children to present what you presented tonight um, because it's important that the community know that we're about what's right for children and our staff. So thank you. Thank I'd you like so to, I'd like to thank all the people who presented tonight because I think you did an excellent job. It was well presented. Everybody's got the pension interest. We might not all have, agree on everything, but we got the pension interest of students and everybody at heart. Uh, but if, you know, you did a great job. I just wish the board could have gone the other way, but we'll prevail. Our teachers will do the best with whatever they're asked to do. They should be paid a million dollars. They should. Yes. Two. So too. <laughs> for clarification, I had uh, answered some emails to some folks and told them that our first meeting of the month of August was actually August 1st. Actually, our first meeting in the month of August is August 5th. So I, I apologize. I will be emailing all of you back to let you know that August 5th, August 19th, our work session, uh, we will have the, re the readiness for opening of schools. If at that time things have changed and we can go to the hybrid, we will make a motion to Absolutely. We, you know, any time in the course of this next semester, if it is possible to have our students back in the schools, I, for one, will be changing my vote to do just that. So I want to make every, everyone very aware of that. I am, you know, this is all about safety of our community at the moment. Anything else, Dr. Kane? No, that is thank it you, for us. Everyone, thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Do I have a motion to close? We're good. Do I have a motion to close our open session? So moved. I have a second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to close open, this ocean, open session. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening.